And if it needs to be updated, I'll do so at another time. We have a motion made by Councilwoman Second. Hurt Hurtak, seconded by Councilman Miranda. All in favor? Aye. Uh, Shirley, Councilman Carlson, you're recognized. I, I think um, I, I encourage everybody to read Justin Garcia's article yesterday in Creative Loafing and the follow up. And um, we've seen a lot of information coming out that although it may be technically accurate, it's not exactly accurate and maybe misleading. And so I would I would encourage in the report that's coming back that that we be transparent and accurate in um, the information that's given. Thank you. Thank you. Agenda item number five. Keep that. Thank you very much. Uh, agenda item number six, I have spoken with uh, Vic Bide, head of the mobility department, and I have had my questions answered. Does any other member, board member, excuse me, council member, want to? I, I just made a comment, Chairman. These are things that happen when council, this council, past council, future council, because it continues. <coughs> Have a situation when you pass a zoning and you have to have those swales, I guess. And what happens is, in good faith, the individual who has that doesn't do anything, he complies, but he sells it to someone else. But there's no tracing mechanism as to how that goes back to that the individual who bought it understand that's what we have to fix. Yes, sir. Uh, and I, I probably will make a motion later on today that we have this on a workshop where we can actually ask mobility and legal to come in and let's see what can be done if, if, if the city can take a, a role in this? Yes, Councilwoman Hurtak. Um, yeah, there was no, there was no um, actual written information about this. So I was gonna say yes, I definitely want okay. them. But if you are going to propose uh, this for a workshop item, I'm absolutely, I think that's a much better time so that we don't spend time today on it. So I'm, I'm yes, okay, I, let's, yeah. Do we will move agenda item number six. We can set it for a workshop now if you want. Yeah, yeah. What? Um, okay. When is a, when is a workshop right after the first of the year? This gives sixty days uh, for this. That would be February. Ooh, February twenty third. How full are we with workshops that day? Six, seven items. March twenty third. Yeah. Well, I will entertain a motion. I have a motion I'll made by Councilman uh, Miranda, seconded by Councilman Maniscalco. All in favor? Aye. Thank you. Agenda item number seven. I'd like to, uh, I sent a memo on this. I'd like to continue this to January 17th, uh, 19th. Uh, two, two reasons. One is because it doesn't mention the word pure, and people were surprised about it. Um, and then, uh, yeah. Second. Motion oh. made. Oh, sorry. Made by Councilman Carlson, seconded by Councilman Maniscalco. Any further discussion? Yes. Um, I know that we have actual um, community members here to talk about this today. Uh, so I, um, th the other issue with this is um, I read the memo and it does, this does not say pure, but we had agreed to stop calling this pure. So what, I, I don't disagree that we need to have some type of, um, uh, wording so that the public knows. Do you want to keep the pure label or would you prefer to do a different label? I don't remember, sorry, I don't remember, Mr. Chair. Councilman Carlson. I don't remember um, changing the label on it, but this one is, uh, you know, this is the city's excuse for doing pure. So, um, uh, and I think the public knows that a city in years past lobbied to get this passed. So, I, I think we, it, it, just for transparency reasons, I think we should call it pure because it's related to pure, but then we, it, and, and I'd like to hear from the public today, but um, there were people who, who last night contacted me and said, we would like to talk about it, but now we, we've already scheduled other things. So if we knew that it was pure, we would have flagged it and talked to it. So we can hear today and we can also hear on January 19th. Okay, um, that, that's, I'm fine with that. And if you are asking that anything water related still have the pure tag, I'm fine with Not that Not all too. water, just, just, just things related to pure. And, the, and one thing I, Mr. Chair. If, 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 please, Ms. Carlson, then I, then I have a comment to make after you're finished. Yeah, I think obviously we're gonna end up into, into deeper discussions about pure um, sometime soon. And I would just encourage my colleagues to look at all the legal avenues and, and lobbying avenues we can to stop it because um, I've talked to people around the state and there's, there's no reason why Tampa should be doing it, but this seems to be moving forward in a very suspicious way. Thank you. 
Miss Duncan. Uh, yes, we were perfectly um, interested in accommodating the council's interests and requests. <clears throat> I would just say on, on the labeling of pure, it was made very clear by the community and uh, the some of the council anyway, that pure as it was presented previously in terms of a contract with certain framework and parameters and time frame was no longer going to be active in that state. Correct. What's active in that state is the remainder of the contract dollars to address the motions that were made by this body. So there's no formal pure project. There's no formal pure project in that same uh, framework and that same condition. <clears throat> However, we are still as responsible uh, experts in the field going to pursue and research and study and coordinate with other agencies and all those other due diligence actions of making sure we have a safe, reliable water supply, environmental conditions for our water resource and all those related um, aspects. So with that, we would suggest that PURE already has a certain connotation and a certain sense of understanding with the very little public engagement we were able to do. So we would recommend just something a little more generic. Uh, and if that is now known amongst the stakeholders and the interested parties, that that label is representing these water type of conversations, that might be a better way to go. But we're, we're willing to do whatever the council would, re would request. <coughs> Councilman Goods. Thank you, Chairman. Ms. Duncan, when are we going to bring this to a, a close? When are we going to say this is the project, this is what we believe, we've heard from the public, these are the choices, what does council want to do? When is that so we can get the pure name, what are we going to do so we can move on with this water situation? It's been lingering forever. I want to know when are we going to say we have a definitive project to say this is the recommendation we believe from our experts, versus what the public says, and here it is, what do you want to do? What is council's pleasure? So the activity that's occurring now is, is working on the various motions that came out in September, with the major one being in February, a workshop on the work that our consultant is doing in concert with the city and other agencies to respond to that motion. We do not have a contract opportunity to take things any further because council has not approved anything further for us. So that is the landing point for now in terms of a public discussion, the workshop in September. Thank you. Councilman Moran. Just for the easing of mind, uh, if, if something is for pure, it's got to have the name of pure of it on it, and this council has to vote on it for any funding. Am I correct? Yes, but there is no more pure uh, I project. I understand but I'm yes, getting to a right. point. I'm getting to a point. And the point is that if somebody was to do that, it'd be drastically impossible to understand that the public understand what that individual, he or she did in a higher office than we are to do something like that. That would be inappropriately at any time, number one. Number two, is it related or not related? Well, if it's water, everything is related. But Pure is not involved in this. It's like everybody in my family have the last name of Miranda. They don't. And I have 50-some cousins, and they all have different last names. That doesn't mean they're me. That means they're related to me. The same thing here. So I try to make things so that we understand what's going on. And I'm just giving a classic example. If it doesn't have the funding for pure, it cannot be pure because you cannot transfer money from something that's approved to something that's not approved by this council. And to be afraid of something, we're going to be stalemated. In other water agencies, they think about 15, 20, and 30, and 40 years away to plan for growth. They have all those plannings. And you just got to go listen to them. They come up on Channel 3. I know that everyone doesn't have Channel 3 because that's a non-area that you don't need the internet or TVG or whatever it is to, to get on. So these things are explained in those meetings very carefully and very thoughtfully. And they understand, the public should understand exactly what it is. So I'm not saying to vote it up or down. It's up to each individual's council members. But if it's going to be pure, it's got to have a name of pure. Just because it's water doesn't mean it's attached at the umbilical cord to make it a, a part of the memory family of water. That's all. Mr. Chair. Councilman Carlson. Yeah, um, I can make a motion at the end to come up with a different label and maybe the public, I would call it toilet tap, but um, <clears throat> maybe somebody else will have a different label uh, that they'll suggest. Um, 
The, uh, the, the reason why this is tied to PURE is that over the last three and a half years, we've disproven every argument the Water Department made for this project, and the only one left is that they're quote unquote forced to do it by the, by the state. When I contacted the state, they said that's rubbish. Um, the state uh, um, responded now negatively in what I believe to be a very suspicious way. We can talk about that in January. And, uh, and so what we need to do is, is figure out how to stop this project from another. It, it, the Tampa, as you know, Tampa Bay Water has a 20-year plan and a 10-year supply, and we're a part of that. Um, we're not going to need 50 MGD for 100 years, and it doesn't make sense to um, spend the money today for something we're not going to need for 100 years. So uh, we can talk about that in January, but it's, it's tied to pure only, or, or whatever we call the project, only because this is going to be the justification that we have to move forward by state law. But we have a legal team, we have a lobbying team. Um, although the lobbyists of the city have been working in favor of this in the past, we as city council should have some influence to either stop them from doing that or ask them to give us an exception because it's, it's crazy that we would put this on the backs of our uh, uh, rate payers. Thank you. Ms. Duncan. Um, I would just like to say that we have worked very hard to be as transparent as we can, considering we don't have funding for a public engagement plan to have really true, proper, comprehensive public engagement. Our public engagement is very limited to a few people that take their precious free time and get involved with these topics, and we appreciate that. But does that is not representing the entire city uh, viewpoint of things, because we haven't had a chance to have that public engagement. I would also just like to say, I just take exception, the word suspicious. We have worked very hard to be transparent, to include all parties of interest, to include the appropriate agencies. We don't have any information or evidence that we've done anything that should be considered suspicious. So I would just appreciate if we can keep our con 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 conversations factual and professional and not bring in accusations that can't be proven. Councilwoman Hurtak, and then I'm going to go to Councilman Miranda. Um, and uh, I'm, I'm personally fine hearing it today. I'm also, if um, Council Member Carlson uh, really wants it in January, I'm happy to do January. The, the only thing I asked, uh, I spoke to Ms. Duncan last night, and the only thing I asked is that the actual um, literature that's, that, uh, that we sent to the, the state and that the state sent back to us be added to SIRE, and you said that you could do that at some point today. So, yeah, that, so, so that the public has a chance to go and look at it. If they're listening right now or listening later, they'll have a chance to look at those documents. So that is definitely physically possible. Mm -hmm. The concern I had after we spoke last night is that this is really a, a verbal administrative update. There wasn't any protocol or process that this type of thing would be loaded in SIRE. And because we had personally emailed the parties that were interested in this topic that this just didn't really even come into the thought process of doing that. Yeah. I would just say we need to be thoughtful about what is our, where do we draw that line and what is our process for something reaching the level of being to put into SIRE and how do we all know what that is so that we don't have it one interpretation and council has another. So I haven't put the items in SIRE just because I wanted to have that uh, opportunity to offer that thought of council having of where do we draw that line? I don't mean that in a negative way, just where is that point of decision to put in or not? Um, and I would just say with this particular issue, since we are talking about um, their response, that it would be nice to, to see the response. So I'm, I'm, uh, I, I definitely think the language should be included. Um, so it's, it's council's pleasure. I, I'm fine hearing it today, I'm also, uh, but if we do hear it today, we would, I would also like to be able to hear it in the future because folks didn't have necessarily the time to look at the data or the information. Okay. <laughs> Councilman Miranda. I'll hold to January or like uh, Council Member Hurtak said, I'm flexible here today, I'll hold to January. It makes no difference to me. Council, Council Members, we have spent more time talking about this issue than we have <coughs> what was probably was going to be presented. May I see in council chambers a great show of hands of how many people are here to speak or listen to this staff report? Just a show of hands. 
Council members, if I may, why don't we just hear this, and if somebody wishes to make this a workshop on the 17th, we can do that. What is the pleasure of council? So move, Mr. Chairman. Second, hear it today. The people are here. I hate to see them come Thank back. Thank you. Let's start. Let's talk about agenda item number eight. If we can, Mr. Chairman, I'm sorry to interrupt, but before we do that, just so the public is clear, this being a staff report, council's protocol is for that to be heard during upfront, during gen general public Correct. comment. So if you wish to speak to that particular item, the time Good to do that is, is public comment. Thank you, sir. Thank, Thank you very much. Councilman Carlson. Just one last comment. The, the primary reason, one of the reasons why I wanted to defer it is because it didn't say pure, and we can resolve that naming issue. But the second was that those documents were not attached to SIRE. And if there's an official document that's coming from DEP where some, some board or group is going to officially uh, reject our application, then we should, we should hold this until that comes. Right now, we, it's already circulating in public record that we got a couple emails from a person, and really that's all the report is today. And so I, I feel if, if, we're going to, if we're going to move a $6 billion project forward because a person sent a one or two line email, then I think that is definitely should be a public, a public record that would be shown to the public in advance. Thank you. Councilwoman Hurtak. Um, it is coming, uh, the, we were supposed to have the 17 questions from the Friends of the River answer today and that's been continued to January 19th, which is why I know you wanted to continue this to January 19th. Can we add that as well to January 19th? So can we hear the report and then be able to talk about it on the 19th? Is that a compromise we could do? I'll withdraw my motion. All right. Thank you. All right, agenda item number eight. Ms. Travis, will, will we will be hearing that? Nope. Let's, okay. let's, I let's, provided let's... a written report, thank you. Okay, that is a written report. Like number eight, I would like to uh, I would like to bring this back on uh, April 16th uh, for an update. Second. Motion made by Councilman Carlson, seconded by Councilman Maniscalco. All in favor? Aye. Aye. Thank you. Agenda item number nine, we will be hearing that. Ms. Rebecca Johns will be <coughs> discussing that. Agenda item number 10, yes. Agenda item number 11. Um, I, I, got a, uh, I got the written update and I'm, I'm Sorry, uh, I got the written update and I'm fine with the written update. What is the pleasure of council? That's fine. We'll move that from the agenda. 11. 11. Yes, because that's on a quarterly basis, so it will be coming back to us in February. So it's just a quarterly report. Motion made by Councilwoman Hurtak, seconded by? Second. There, there is no, I mean, it's already. Fine. Yeah. We're good. Yeah, we see the file, yeah. Thank you. Uh, agenda item number 12. Okay, number 13. No, wait, wait, there's a mo motion to continue that to December 15th. Under Second. Staff report. Thank you. Motion made by? Is that? Item 12. Oh, 12. Okay. Motion made by Councilman Mascot, seconded by Councilwoman Hurtak. All in favor? Aye. Aye. Number 13. I'd like to continue this to January 19th. Second. That requests this time. Motion made by Councilman Carlson, seconded by Councilman Mascot. All in favor? Aye. Mr. Chairman. Councilman Goose. With all due respect, we've, we've kicked this item down the road on numerous occasions. S somebody just um, unforeseen uh, circumstances, <coughs> but I'd like to bring this hopefully to a closure. It needs to be brought to a closure. Mr. Shelby, me and you had a discussion in the back, sir. With the discussion we had, I wanna make sure that you include our discussion yes. in reference to uh, there was a, a motion put on the floor back a while ago, and I know you're a humble guy, uh, but uh, sometimes you can be humble, but you need to be forthcoming to what needs to be done. So I'm hoping that you'll discuss that issue uh, that was put before us before yes. with this here, because that needs to be discussed. <coughs> so I uh, just want to make sure we, we, we get it all in one shot so the public can know, uh, this council can know, and that way you can do your job more effectively. Thank you, Council. I appreciate that. And I uh, want, to know, want you to know that I did have the opportunity to speak with most members of Council regarding this, and I understand the need for closure. And I've uh, talked with the maker of the motion, and um, we'll be prepared to move forward on the 19th. Thank you, sir. Thank you. Uh, Jedi item number 14, I believe there is a 
Ask for a continuance. Second. Motion made by Councilman Maniscalco, Motion made by Councilman Maniscalco, seconded by Councilwoman Hertak. All in favor? Aye. Motion to continue item 15 to February 23rd, 2023, per request of staff. Motion made by Councilman Maniscalco, seconded by Me. Councilman Miranda. All in favor? Aye. Aye. There is a motion to uh, agenda item 16 to continue until January 19th. So moved. Second. Motion made by Councilman Maniscalco, seconded by Councilman Miranda. All in favor? Aye. Aye. And then for agenda item number 17, a request until February 2nd. So moved. Mr. 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 Chairman. Yes, sir. Councilman Goods. Uh, I did speak with uh, Ms. Hills in reference to this item. Uh, because I was going to uh, want her to talk about this today, but after giving, getting her explanation, uh, I'll go ahead and support the continuance uh, for the 60 days. <laughs> Motion made by Councilman Maniscalco, seconded by, I apologize, by Councilman Miranda. All in favor? Aye. Aye. Okay. February 2nd. Have any other changes to the addendum? That's it. That's it. May I have a motion to accept the uh, so moved. second motion made by Councilman Maniscalco, seconded by Councilman Goods. All in favor? Aye. 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 Thank you. At this time, we will now take public comment. Anyone wishing to give public comment at this time, if you could please form a line on my left, your right. <coughs> Anyone wishing to make public comment? Good morning. Good morning. Uh, my name is Justin Tramble. I'm the executive director of Tampa Bay Waterkeeper. We're a uh, nonprofit that uh, fights for clean water in not only in Hillsborough County, but Pinellas County, we represent the community's right to clean water. Um, I'm here today to uh, discuss the item that you guys were just talking about there. Uh, Tampa Bay Waterkeeper uh, appreciates the, uh, the questions uh, regarding the, the discharge project. We appreciate the strict scrutiny that the community uh, and organizations uh, have provided you all. Um, but uh, big picture, uh, the city of Tampa currently discharges a Piney Point uh, crisis worth of nutrients a year into Hillsborough Bay. Uh, we support the conversation regarding ways to largely reduce or eliminate the average of 50 million gallons of treated reclaimed water being discharged daily. So we support the conversation. Um, and we appreciate the conversation. Uh, eliminating or significantly reducing these nutrients is good for Tampa Bay. Becoming a more resilient and sustainable region protects not only our watershed, uh, but our community, ensuring fishable, swimmable, and drinkable water for all. So we appreciate the conversation. Uh, we see it as an opportunity. So thank you. Is that a snook or a tarpon on your hat? That's a tarpon. Thank you. It's a cool hat, right? Councilman Miranda. Uh, I just want to thank uh, Mr. Campbell for coming out. I never met him, and he sort of spoke clear on the issues, and I believe that's about 370 tons of those nutrients that you're talking about. Thank you. Hi, good morning. I'm Nancy good Stevens, a, a conservation chair for the Tampa Bay Sierra Club and member of the Pure Stakeholders Group, talking item seven, and thank you, uh, Justin, we, we do agree we, don't, we, we want clean um, water going into the bay. Don't disagree with that. What we want to talk about today is the state mandate that mandates us to take all of our wastewater and do something else with it besides putting it into the bay. You get to remember that Tampa Bay is an estuary, one, one of the most outstanding estuaries in the United States. As defined by the Tampa Bay Estuary Program, an estuary is a semi-enclosed body of water where fresh water from the rivers meets and mixes with the salt water from the ocean. Estuaries are a transition zone from land to sea and support a spectacular abundance and diversity of wildlife. They're considered one of the most 
Productive environments in the world are often referred to as the nursery ground for fish, crustaceans, and shellfish, where juvenile marine animals can hide from predators. Tampa's reclaimed wastewater provides a valuable freshwater flow to the Tampa Bay estuary. Replacing some of the fresh water that Tampa and Tampa Bay water withdraw from the Hillsborough River and Tampa Bypass Canal for drinking water. However, as you will hear today, we are discussed, Santa Bell 64, which requires the elimination of surface water discharges, has a big gap with unintended consequences. It does not cover the ecological benefit to estuaries, even though they rely on freshwater flow. You'll see that the DEP based its response by lumping estuaries as part of marine waters. Estuaries are quite different from oceans and have different needs. Therefore, we drafted proposed legislation to add language to the statute to allow for using reclaimed water to provide fresh water flows to estuaries. We're asking you today to make this one of your legislative priorities. If Tampa were forced to reroute all 50 million gallons a day of wastewater for other purposes, it'd be a huge cost to Tampa Bay taxpayers in the billions of dollars, and it could possibly imp adversely impact the estuary, depriving it of the constant freshwater flow that wildlife have come to rely on. But allowing uh, the continuation of the current discharge as part of a solution um, into the estuary as a beneficial use would give Tampa flexibility to pursue using the reclaimed water for needed purposes that are in the best public interest and retreating the water as to the appropriate levels to, meet, meet, to make it safe for the purpose. And that would result in a lower cost overall since the reclaimed water would be, be treated only as needed for each use. And you know, controlling nitrogen in the bay is key um, for that um, as well. Um, we asked the mayor and city council to listen to citizens' concerns and make this one of your top legislative priorities. Please don't allow the state to, the state to force Tampa residents to spend billions of dollars to treat and reroute large quantities of wastewater reuse that we don't need and could potentially be harmful to the water resources, human health, and the environment of our region. Thank you. Thank you. Well, good morning. My name is Sid Flannery. I'm a longtime resident of the Tampa area and a retired chief environmental scientist with the Southwest Florida Water Management District, where I worked for nearly 30 years studying and managing freshwater flow to estuaries, including the establishment of minimum flow rules for rivers that flow to Tampa Bay. In response to the requirements of Senate Bill 64 that was passed by the Florida legislature in 2021, City staff recently submitted a request to the Florida Department of Environmental Protection to determine if discharges from the city's Howard F. Curran Advanced Wastewater Treatment Plant provide ecological benefits to Tampa Bay. With that request, staff submitted a 20-page technical report I prepared on that subject and had previously submitted to city staff for their review. The DEP denied the request to recognize the ecological benefits of discharge from the city's AWT plant to Tampa Bay. In a short email response, DPP replied, and I quote, the ecological benefit provision in Senate Bill 64 addresses water quantity through implementation of minimum flow and minimum level MFL requirements. Marine discharges do not have an MFL classification. Therefore, the discharge of the Howard F. Curran Advanced Weight Water Treatment Facility as it currently exists does not qualify for the ecological benefit provision in Senate Bill 64. <clears throat> this finding by DEP reflects a major shortcoming in the natural resource protection language in Senate Bill 64. Even though a minimum flow rule has not been established specifically for Tampa Bay, freshwater flow is critical to maintaining the water quality and ecology and biological productivity of the bay. The fact that the city's discharge is located on said and channel which DEP categorizes as a marine water, does not negate the importance of this discharge to Tampa Bay. In my opinion, DEP's conclusion was not sufficiently science or resource based, but instead was based on a technical bureaucratic ambiguity that resulted from a lack of clarity in Senate Bill 64. <laughs> After careful review, I and members of several organizations that are on the city's pure stakeholders group believe that additional language needs to be passed by the Florida legislature and adopted in Florida statutes to remedy the inadequacy of the language in Senate Bill 64. <clears throat> Accordingly, we've prepared a draft document and recommended language that can be added to the statute to allow for more, a more comprehensive assessment 
of the beneficial effects of surface discharges to water bodies, including estuaries such as Tampa Bay. We would be happy to share our document with you and discuss the straightforward language we have proposed that can remedy this problem. We hope that after careful consideration, the city can support our recommended addition to this statute in your legislative agenda for 2023. I have to wrap up my comments now, but I will be happy to remain in the chamber when this topic comes up on your agenda later today. If you have any questions about our recommended additions to the statute, thank you very much for your time. Thank you. Mr. Chairman. Councilman Goose. Ms. Duncan, have you seen this gentleman's recommendations uh, since he's an expert in reference to the legislative language being looked at? I have not seen um, the reference information Mr. Flannery is talking about. Uh, I'm sure he will be providing it to us. Well, let's make sure we get that. He is right. The legislative session is coming up here with the local body here. And as you review that, uh, probably before the workshop, maybe you can get that to our legislative people here to give that to the delegation to look at because maybe maybe the rule is there but maybe uh, just like here sometimes we pass things we have to come back to look at things that are not totally clear so i'm hoping you get this information and if we can get a chance to look at that to move forward if you would please certainly okay councilman carlson i i want to say thank you first of all for all the hard work you put into the 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 letter that was sent and I thank you also to Chuck Weber and staff for submitting your letter. And when I mentioned the word suspicious a little while ago, I, I didn't mean to infer that something was happening at the water department, but we know in the past that the city uh, lobbying team and public affairs team has worked in favor of this. And they've told me outright that they're in favor of it and not against it. They were very reluctant to allow uh, uh, the water department to send out that, your memo. And so um, I think we, we, we've so far had multiple votes of city council against this project. And by now, if the city was operating as one entity, the lobbying team and legal team would have been looking for solutions to try to stop this. And, uh, and they haven't. Uh, unfortunately, neither one really reports to city council. Um, we need to do everything we can to stop it. The suspicious part I talked about, which you just referenced, <clears throat> is it's a state law, but somehow the, the two or three sentence excuse was that it doesn't hit, hit MFL. Well, what about cities and counties that don't have rivers? Um, it, it, it is, it, it's a, it, it, that, that's language that looks like it was put in there by Tampa lobbyists years ago. And I know that Tampa lobbyists were there because I have lobbyists in Tallahassee that talked to legislators after they went through and talked to them. And I can get my lobbyists to go talk to DEP and find out if anybody from the city has reached out to them in the last month. But <clears throat> we need to work together as an entity. The public doesn't want this. It's a huge burden for taxpayers. People already are paying too much and they don't want their water bill doubled or tripled. And, um, and we need to work together. The administration and the city council needs to work together to stop this. Thank you. I will I, give you a rebuttal. Uh, not a rebuttal, but just one follow-up point that I didn't have time in my three minutes. I want to emphasize, if we recognize there are ecological benefits of the discharge of Tampa Bay, that does not preclude the pursuit of reclaimed water projects. Reclaim water projects could be evaluated for the quantity that you need. Now you can say that's sort of being, you know, whatever the quantity is, but it means where the discharge is occurring now is actually okay, okay? And it, you can still pursue reclaim water projects individually on a case by case basis. Similarly, if the Tampa Bay Estuary Program says we need to do, uh, you know, more nutrient reduction, that could be pursued. Amending the, the statute, as we suggest, what it does do, it gets a city out from this hammer. If you have to do something with 50 MGD in 10 years, it allows more operational flexibility to review reclaimed water projects on a case-by-case -case basis. Thank you. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Councilwoman Hurtak. I was just going to ask if you could just go ahead and send that information to all of us. That would be wonderful. It'll be today, soon, by, by lunchtime probably. Thank you. <laughs> One question, Mr. Councilman Mr. Miranda. Mr. Campbell spoke about the amount of nutrients going into the bay. Can you tell us the amount of tonnage, since you're an expert, what goes in there? I said something, maybe I was wrong, incorrect when I said it, and I just want some clarity on what I said. How many tons of nutrients go into the bay every year? I, I do not know that precisely. I've read those documents, and I've actually, the report I've got has graphics uh, of nutrients, or, or uh, nitrogen loading to the bay. And one thing we should all be very happy about, Tampa Bay long-term has been improving, in large part to the advanced wastewater treatment at the Howard F. Current plant. Okay. So. Amending this legislation would not preclude nutrient reduction strategies either. 
that could be still pursued if necessary. In fact, you're correct. But I know that it, it improved better to, to just it, as I say, it was better now than it was in the 50s. Very much so. Even thank you very much. I appreciate your seriousness. No, thank you. <laughs> I'm not, believe me, I'm not going to forget the seagrass. That's an expert. Good morning. Good morning. I'm Phil Compton with Friends of the Hillsborough River, but today I'm sharing with you some comments from Sierra Club's Vice Chair Gary Gibbons, who's also the chair of our political committee, who's unable to attend today's city council meeting due to a schedule conflict. But Gary wants me to tell you that I have practiced law for more than 43 years, and each year after the legislative session, attorneys need to review the session laws to see what changes have been made to existing law. Many times, it is a tweak of the language in an existing law that has a defect or omission, which or it needs clarification because of an ambiguity is causing litigation. Senate Bill 64 is a prime example of the type of statute that needs further clarification. Quite frankly, Senate Bill 64 was an ambitious one-size-fits-all attempt to deal with an extremely complex issue, requiring utilities to safely repurpose wastewater for beneficial uses across a state that is too large and too diverse in its geology and its topography to allow a one-size-fits-all approach. In, our, in one of our many stakeholder meetings with city staff over the past two years, former city attorney Jan McLean <coughs> described Senate Bill 64 as a solution looking for a problem. While I agree with Jan's characterization of Senate Bill 64, it is now law, and the time has come to ask that its omissions be corrected, be fixed by corrective legislation that will revise it appropriately. Sid Flannery, who has devoted his life's work as a scientist at Swift Mud and who is a renowned expert on minimum flows on the Hillsborough River and the effect of those flows on estuarine waters, such as Tampa Bay, has recognized serious shortcomings in the language of Senate Bill 64, which need to be revised through new legislation. Senate Bill 64 was hurriedly passed in 2021, and as we all have to deal with its approaching deadlines, it is more important than ever to quickly address the omissions in the current law. Mr. Flannery has not only identified the problems with Senate Bill 64, he has also drafted curative language for the statute to fix a glaring omission and to provide much needed flexibility for the city of Tampa to deal with its own site-specific issues, which are completely different than those being dealt with in Miami or the Panhandle. The stakeholders have discussed the need to seek revisions of Senate Bill 64 with city staff on many occasions. Today, we, the stakeholders, asked city council to make a formal request to the mayor to have these revisions to Senate Bill 64 become the top priority for the city of Tampa's lobbyists to seek passage of the language proposed by Mr. Flannery and the stakeholders, which we see as a win-win for everyone in the city of Tampa. Let's take a proactive step to fix the statute so that the city will have the flexibility that it needs to explore all alternatives for the safe reuse of its treated wastewater. Thank you. Mr. Cobb. Yes, sir. Councilwoman Hertak. Can, uh, can you please ask uh, Mr. Gibbons to send his legislative solution to all of us? I believe what he was referring to is the language that Mr. Okay. Flannery has okay, drafted, perfect. which then we were just discussing, excellent. along with his report, okay. which identifies perfect. the situation. Thank you. Thank you very much. And may, may I add, please, uh, years ago, I worked with uh, Jan McLean for uh, fertilizer ordinance here, which has been extremely successful. And that was part of the Sierra Club's statewide effort to get fertilizer ordinances passed in over 100 cities and counties. But we never said that the state of Florida should have one fertilizer type of rule because the state is too big and diverse, and in some places it wouldn't make sense. Same thing's true here. Thank you. If my memory serves a correct, sir, that's called the May to November ordinance. I'm sorry? That ordinance is called the May to November. Uh, it is May, November. yeah. It's... Uh, June through October. And I believe Tampa was one of the first to pass it. Uh, yes, Pinellas County has the exact same rule. Thank you very much. Thank you. Mr. Compton. Yes, sir. <laughs> Before I leave. <laughs> Happy birthday. Well, thank you, sir. It was yesterday, but thank you. And you can now put up Christmas decorations because it's after my birthday. Thank you. <laughs> Good morning. My name is Carol Camisa. I'm here as a member of the stakeholders group but also representing the League of Women Voters of Hillsborough County. Uh, my interest is in, in engaging the public in issues, policy, and, and so on that, that impact people's lives. To do that, we educate people. We're also interested, and I'm, and I'm, I'm very pleased that this body uh, reflects an interest in 
transparency, accurately, accuracy of information going to the public, and so on. And I, I'm sorry, I, I kind of water under the bridge, bad choice of words, but I, I feel it's necessary to correct. The stakeholders group has done an awful lot in terms of public education, and we have reached out to a lot of different groups. I would venture to say that before the, the September City Council meeting, we did more in a month's time with no money reaching out to community groups than has been done to date with regard to uh, this project. And um, I have yet to hear any accountability in terms of the funding that was, was given to the Water Department for um, two specific tasks under PURE, one of which was public education. So I, I just feel like it's important to correct that record. Um, in any case, um, you uh, no doubt remember uh, previous discussions um, when uh, Tampa citizens spoke up about their concerns about the costs, about the safety of water, uh, potable water supply in Tampa. And my concern now is that this uh, Senate Bill 64 seems to jeopardize these objectives. Um, so we are pursuing uh, some alternative language to fix that, as you've heard from my, my uh, colleagues. So uh, the current law under Senate Bill 64 doesn't really address environmental issues related to treated wastewater discharges into the bay. And that's not something that's uh, well understood by uh, city residents. They're concerned about how much they're gonna pay when they open the tap that it's safe. But I think uh, you would uh, agree that it's really your job to understand those kind of things and to represent Tampa's best interests. So we talked about uh, the previous comments that this is a rather blunt instrument, a one size fits all kind of approach that doesn't really meet the needs of Tampa. We need more flexibility. Um, we need to be able to adapt to specific local conditions and uh, that are different in different parts of the state. Um, I, I further sort of object that, that this is kind of a, an unfunded mandate out of Tallahassee that tells you to fix something and there's no funding involved. Um, so the legislative proposal for which we're seeking your support would allow Tampa the flexibility to meet the intent of SB 64 while allowing for necessary flexibility and adaptability. Thank you. Thank you. Hi, my name is Carol Ann Bennett. I am a lifelong resident of Tampa. The addition to Florida statutes that we are recommending will allow recognition of the benefits of our discharges to Tampa Bay and will not preclude the evaluation of other reclaimed water projects. Instead, it would give the city much greater flexibility to evaluate these projects in quantities that are needed, that are cost effective, that protect the water resources and the natural environment, and are in the best public interest. This is much different than requiring the city to eliminate and reroute 50 million gallons of discharge a day in the next 10 years, which the current statute does. Our additions to the statute will remedy this dilemma. We are asking City Council to make a formal request to the mayor to make this the top priority for the city's lobbyists and to seek passage of the lang language proposed by Mr. Flannery and the stakeholders, which we see as a win-win for everyone in the city of Tampa. Let's take a proactive step and fix this statute so the city will have the flexibility it needs to explore all, alterna all alternatives for the safe reuse of its treated wastewater. And I, like Carol, take exception to the characterization of the stakeholders as being just a few people. Um, we all represent organizations that amount to tens of thousands of people. We've all gone through the processes that these organizations require to be able to represent them um, in front of you. Um, I am the THAN representative in the city's pure stakeholders group. Uh, THAN's members and all Tampa residents are very, very concerned about the safety of their water and how much it costs. There was a recent unanimous THAN vote to that effect. You all also received many emails expressing the unanimous concerns of the citizens. How many emails did you receive supporting PURE? The citizens and members of THAN, THAN have not been made aware of this thing that we're addressing today. They've not been made aware of that yet. But when they do, they will be writing to City Council and the Mayor asking you to make this a top legislative priority. 
we will all be happy to work with the city to make sure the citizens' voices are heard. And just on a per, uh, personal note that Charlie mentioned about the bay, um, when I was a kid, uh, our car didn't have air conditioning. And no matter how hot it was, when we had to drive down Bayshore, we drove with the windows rolled up because the stench was absolutely <laughs> nauseating. And I know Charlie probably remembers that too. And I remember looking at the beautiful houses well, some at that time were actually abandoned, but the beautiful houses that were on Bayshore Bay, on Bayshore Boulevard, and wondering how do they live with this? How how can they do this? And maybe that's why so many houses were abandoned. So we've come a long way, and we have made advances in our ecological benefits to the bay. Thank you. Hello, everybody. My name is Jamie Clapholtz. I am a resident of the city of Tampa for over 10 years, and I'm here to speak about agenda item number 19, which is the proposed language um, to provide an independent counsel for the Citizens Review Board. Um, and I think that I, I applaud all of you for moving that forward because I think that an independent counsel for the Citizens Review Board is crucial to um, maintain its independence and to prevent conflicts of interest. And I'd just like to read something that I think is really applicable from the website of the National Association of Civilian Oversight of Law Enforcement with respect to the importance of independence. And it says, one of the most important and defining concepts of civilian oversight of law enforcement is independence. In its broadest sense, it refers to an absence of real or perceived influence from law enforcement, political actors, and other special interests looking to affect the operations of the civilian oversight agency. In order to maintain legitimacy, an agency must be able to demonstrate the extent and impact of its independence from the overseen law enforcement agency, especially in the face of high profile issues or incidents. And so um, with that, I uh, want to address the specific language that has been presented to you by the city attorney's office. Um, for this uh, proposed ordinance change or proposed, proposed charter change rather. Um, the current language before you from the city attorney's office would provide that the city has the sole power to select, uh, to hire and fire essentially the attorney for the citizens review board, which would really not correct the problem about conflict of interest that currently exists with it being staffed by an assistant city attorney. And so I sent you all an email last night um, with a request to make two modifications to that language. The first modification would be to provide that the Citizens Review Board is the body that has sole authority to hire and fire its own attorney. And the second modification is to um, delete language from the end of that um, proposed sentence that is unnecessary and potentially confusing um, as detailed in the email. The language is um, off the top of my head was for the Tampa Police Department, I believe, which is really an unnecessary part of that sentence. And so I hope that you all will um, make those two motions to make those modifications and move um, the language forward as I detailed in that email. Thank you very much. Thank you. Hello. My name is Captain Frank Williams located at 1112 East Scott Street, Paradise Missionary Baptist Church. I've been coming down here week after week, month after month, don't seem to get nothing done. But I thank God we are here to, to see another day. Uh, what's your man's name, young man? Guido Maniscalco. That, that was, when the chairman steps out as the vice chair, I, I take over the meeting, so. Oh, okay. Yes, sir. Because uh, I'm going to read some scripture. Very, very, I say unto you, he that believe it on me, that's Jesus talking. He that believe it on me, and the work that he do, shall he do also. Work that I shall do, shall do also. And gather work, and greater work than these shall ye do, because I am my Father. And whosoever ask, ask in my name, that will I give unto thee. My Father is, is glorified in the Son. Thank you, Jesus, that he is. You know, we got many problems here in the United States of America, and it don't seem to be getting no better. It seems to be getting worse and worse and worse. You know, they bit, they Got a retention, they call it a retention pond out there in Belmont Heights. Some 
fine property out there which they took from black folks and started to put retention ponds. I want to know something. Why don't y'all fill in those retention ponds and let me build a nice convention center out there? Y'all can do it because if y'all got any power at all, y'all can do everything else. Y'all be able to do that for me in the name of Jesus. I got to go to court tomorrow, and I'm going to bring all that stuff up. And I would like for all of y'all to be there to show up tomorrow at 9 o'clock, what they call Judge Escom Court. And, uh, you know, I just have so much to say, but when I get up here, I forget about it. But you know what? We got to learn to respect one another and don't just respect certain people because of the color of their skin. Respect all people that we be able to do what we need to do and you all need to do what y'all need to do for us. I know y'all are not going to call me back up here because y'all don't want to hear what I'm saying, but I give God the glory for everything. That's the way I am. And God has been mighty good to all of us. And I just want to praise him everywhere I go. Uh, we have, uh, you know, just like I said, I want to talk about so much. I want to talk, y'all to ring the bell on me. That mean y'all don't want to hear what I got to say. Okay, I said, uh, let me get my Bible and get out of here. Thanks for the little bit y'all heard of. Thank you, sir. Good morning, Council. Good morning. My name is Gretchen Cothran. I'm a Tampa native. I'm also an attorney and a wrongful conviction specialist. I am here to speak on Agenda 19, the Independent Council for the Citizens Review Board. The Citizens Review Board needs a council that is not associated with the city due to a conflict of interest. Even if wholeheartedly the city attorney assigned to the Citizens Review Board stays away from the other tasks of, of its office, it still gives the public perception of the city the attorney who is working for the Citizens Review Board also working for the city. It's a conflict of interest to have the same office on both sides of an investigation. And as an example, the city attorney's office recently settled the lawsuit for the death of um, Arthur Green. So to have an attorney from that office work both on the settlement, protecting the city's interests and the amount of money that the city is going to pay out for his death, to also be the same office that works with the Citizens Review Board, which is tasked on investigating whether or not Tampa Police Department acted properly when Arthur Green died, that's a complete conflict of interest. The Citizens Review Board needs its own independent counsel that is not associated with the city. Um, and as another example, we did see recently um, city attorney's office refusing to protect the interests of city council members when the office is tasked with protecting city council and protecting the city. And I fear that having a city attorney's office also as the attorney for the Citizens Review Board would put that attorney in the same position. That's all that I have. Thank you. Thank you. Good morning. My name is Dave. Uh, and I'm speaking um, uh, against the proposed language um, in agenda item 19. Uh, as it stands right now, the Citizens Review Board's attorney uh, also represents the city, which is a conflict of interest, especially given our ex-police chief mayor, and it'll hinder their, it hinders their ability to um, properly give um, police oversight. And the proposed language makes it so that the city gets to choose their attorney as opposed to having the same attorney, um, which doesn't sound independent to me at all. Um, what I would like to see is for them to have their own attorney, for them to be able to hire and fire whoever they want as their attorney. Um, I mean, given that the mayor's office or the mayor picks half and you all pick half of the 
CRB of the Citizens Review Board, you would think that you'd be able to trust them enough to have power over that themselves. Um, I think it's very important for them to be independent, uh, especially if um, you know they are going to be looking over police cases and giving those recommendations. We want to have them be able to be transparent and able to ca carry out their job so we can have some sort of police transparency and accountability in the city. Thank you. Thank you. Good morning. Um, I have a visual aid on the Elmo, if we could switch to it. Uh, my name is James Michael Shaw, Jr. I'm with the local uh, ACLU chapter. And I want to echo what Attorney Cawthron and Attorney Klappholz have already said about the uh, language on agenda item 19. I don't know how to switch to the Elmo. Is there a button? That it's I, it's there oh, oh, there it is. Okay, so I've, ri I've written out the language that was drafted by the city attorney's office with the modifications that we're asking for. The way they drafted it says the city shall provide legal counsel. Well, the city who? The mayor, you all, the city attorney's office. It doesn't specify. It needs to specify where it comes from. And the motion that was that was made and seconded and passed in November was to model this language off of the similar language from uh, other ordinances and other municipalities. So in, in Miami-Dade City Code 11.5-34B, uh, Orange County City Code, or I'm sorry, Orange County Code 2-195F, and the Key West Charter, Section 1.07, all of them say the, the CRB is, is the, the body that retains the attorney. So the, for it to be truly independent, for it to be perceived as independent by the public, it can't have an attorney that's assigned to it by somebody else. They need to be able to retain their own attorney who can act independently, and, uh, and I would ask that that modification be made to the language. The other one is that, if we can go back to the ELMO, it says, um, as the, to serve as the legal advisor to the Citizens Review Board for the Tampa Police Re Department. That language is unnecessary surplusage. There's only one Citizens Review Board, so you don't have to specify that it's the one for the police department. And it's, um, and it's confusing, too, because it could be read as to serve as the legal advisor for the Tampa Police Department to the <laughs> Citizens Review Board. That language doesn't need to be there, and I would ask that somebody move to strike it. Um, uh, other than that, I just want to say I was struck by the words of the invocation this morning when, when uh, he said that we, you should be guided by what's best for the citizens, not what's best for your networks. Uh, I want to remind you, and we've sent this pulled to you several times, 68% of Tampa voters want to want there to be an independent attorney for the CRB, 68% of the voters. Uh, please don't position yourself in between the will of 68% of the voters and their right to vote on this issue. Um, I, I noticed that today uh, there's not a phalanx of paid police officers behind me, and that might indicate to them that they're okay with letting the civil rights activists just have this one. It's not the, it, it, it's not, Anything radical, it's something that I, I've showed you already is in Miami, Orange County, and Key West. Um, I would ask that you allow the voters to vote on this and, and not position yourselves in between the voters and something that the voters want to vote on. Uh, even though 68% of, of voters favor this provision, 82% favor voting on it. So even people who are against this favor voting on it, favor putting it to a vote. They, they're mature enough to say, I might not personally be in favor of this, but if everyone else is, I'm not going to stand in the way. So I, I ask you to be like those voters and don't stand in the way. I, I have to go back to work, but I'll be watching. The voters will be watching, and we'll notice if you don't let us vote on this. Thank you. Thank you. Ladies and gentlemen, I, if I see no one else standing to speak for public comment, I am going to assume that Bishop Patty will be the last person speaking. No, Rob. I am. That's, that's why I want you to line up over there. I believe you are handing something out from Bishop Patty. Yes, thank you. That would be correct. Bishop Patty, please proceed. Good morning. My name is Bishop Michelle B. Patty. I stand before you as a taxpayer. I've come to ask this city council to make a motion to withhold the $100,000 that y'all have allotted for the NAACP. Reason being, 
uh, for the past three years, there has not been an audit uh, of the NAACP. President Yvette Lewis thereby has violated the uh, bylaws of the NAACP. They're supposed to have a audit every year. That has not been done. Now you, the uh, council, want to give away $100,000 to an organization where there is no transparency, there is no accountability. What I passed out to you was a letter from Toba. Toba is a Tampa organization on black affair, business affairs. They have been a part of political uh, process with the NAAC for many years. And if you can see from their letter, they withdrew their sponsorship of this organization because there was no transparency, uh, there was no accountability of funds. So we're asking, I'm asking as a taxpayer, that you all do your due diligence. I'm often hearing the word transparency, accountability. So $100,000 to an organization that feel that they are above the law, feel that they do not have to adhere to accountability, feel like they don't have to adhere to uh, the rules, then no money should be given until you all can see what has transpired with monies that has already been put in place. There's no scholarships given to any children as of late. There's no businesses that uh, they can point to. So all this would come out in an audit. And the audit need to be asked by this council because we, the voters, voted for you to ensure that our funds are being looked after and not just squandered away as the prayer was that you do what's in the best interest of the citizen and not what you're thinking is going to help propel you into uh, your next arena as a political figure. So I'm hoping that each one of you would do your due diligence that you would do what is right, that you would do right by the people of the city of Tampa, who is counting on you not to squander $100,000 to an organization that will not adhere to transparency and accountability. Thank you. Thank you. <coughs> Mentez not. good morning. For those people who say good morning, we say huru. Huru means freedom in Swahili. And we say we as African people should always be thinking about our freedom. A buffoon, a clown, the class clown, a straight buffoon, nothing more, nothing less. When in this world do you hear African people hating an African people, an African person hating a Chloe Coney? an African person hating on Orlando Goulds with all the discrepancies, an African person hating on Tammy Schamberger when they can't control the situation, a buffoon, nothing more, nothing less, not representative of anything. And to tell all the white people in this city, if you go on Michelle's Patty show, on that Saturday morning, that Clown Central, that's what it is. With Joe Robinson, Clown Central, always talking about putting the FBI and the police on people. A black person, an N, a Negro. Where in this world do you ever hear Negroes talking about calling the police on people? We know where the police do to us. But these clowns, if they can't have it their way, they like gossipers, man. They're garbage. None more, none less. Straight garbage operating in the hood. Where in the hood can you go? Ask anybody in here. You got real Africans in here. Go and ask Rated R. Where in, the, where in the hood you can talk about calling the police or somebody? It's called snitching, and black people don't do it. Even when our family members get killed, black people don't do it. They don't tell who to do it. Am I right or am I wrong? We don't do it. A clown, clown central, and y'all allowing it to happen. Don't go on her show anymore because it's representative of the hatred you have for African people. None more, none less. And being used as a buffoon and a clown. Down here, the oldest civil rights organization in the history of the world trying to take something away from them. 
This city owe us trillions of dollars in reparations and we ain't got that. And a clown down here, a female clown talking about $100,000. The city owe us that 100,000 times over. They owe us African people that 100 times over. We're 26% of population. Stop coming down here talking garbage. Stop coming down here talking about speed bumps and money for parks and money for Juneteenth. And it's garbage. That's bagging. Now you're coming down here with that confusion, bringing that confusion off your radio show right down to city council. It's not going to happen. Not in this city. Not in this city. It's not going to happen. Thank you. Thank you. Say you, 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 got, you think you talking to with your disrespectful sense. <laughs> <laughs> you might bully them, don't bully me, Frank. Uh, good morning, uh, council. That's a lot. Uh, Robin Lockett. Uh, here to talk about uh, the Tender Bill of Rights. I've gotten several calls uh, from different uh, community uh, people uh, indicating that for one whole apartment complex, well, a lot of people in the apartment complex rather, uh, that uh, this apartment com complex is no longer accepting vouchers, Section 8. Got another call uh, from several people stating that their landlord would no longer accept R3 money, R3 program, any assistance. Uh, they want the tenants to pay the money outright. <coughs> Isn't a tenant bill of rights supposed to protect them from that? What's the enforcement on it? How do you enforce it? We put ordinances in place, but there's no enforcement mechanism. And that's what's needed. So we could put a lot of stuff in writing saying, hey, and, and the biggest uh, conversation today has been uh, getting information out to the community. How many of these apartment complexes know that this is in, this is, uh, in, in fact an ordinance, something that they should be abiding by? How do you get that information out? So it's a real problem with putting things in writing with no, no ability to enforce it. it makes it a worth, worthless document. Mr. Chairman. Councilman Goods. Is Ms. Travis still here? I thought she was back. She's there? <coughs> I hate to put you on the spot. Uh, hey, Ms. Travis. Hi, Ms. Lockett. You, you heard oh, Ms. Lockett's <laughs> questions. Yep. Do, do we have a response for her? Well. I know you'll be truthful too, so that's why I called you up. <laughs> the Tenant Bill of Rights is an ordinance and your powers are limited in what you can do. The fine, it's complaint driven, number one. So people have to file a complaint, code enforcement goes out and then you get a fine and the most that we can find the landlord is $450. I mean, what's written in the tenant bill of rights is honestly the most that you can do as a local municipality. We don't have the power we don't have the authority to do more than that, but it's complaint driven. And so if there are complaints, um, like some of the ones that Ms. Lockett just brought up, they need to contact um, code enforcement, file the complaint, and we've had some come through. It's complaint driven, and then we'll follow up and investigate. But to think that the Tenant Bill of Rights is going to solve it all, it's not. All right, question number two. Uh, I know they have this uh, apartment association, mm -hmm. correct? Does yeah. the apartment association, do we have any literature so they can give out to these different apartments in the city so they can know our rules? Have we done that? Or? Yes. So actually, um, our attorney, Rebecca Johns, has done two seminars with the landlords and um, the rental associations and have provided information to them. So we have went there, given them the information, so yes, we have provided that information to all, right, so, all the apartment complexes, not to the complex. To the he was asking right. Asked so about the association. I, I, my, I, yeah. Oh, so okay. I guess the two parts of that. So uh, is it possible that maybe the housing department or can create some type of uh, 
palm card or card that can be taken to with code enforcement on their duties or whatever can stop by these apartment houses and so they make sure these apartment complexes. I'm sure the guy out on the one I'm having an issue with is in Mr. Vieira's district, but even calling me oh, out of Pebblewood, yeah. you know, it can Pebblewood make sure that they, they know what the rules are and what 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 the the ordinances are. Is that possible? Might do something like that. Yes, absolutely. It's, I mean, it's always possible for us to um, create a different ways to get the information out to the public. So we definitely can go back and do that and create a flyer. We do have a flyer with um, information as far as resources, but we could also create um, some kind of education material on if you feel like you've been discriminated against, if you feel like your apartment is substandard and provide that in a different literature. We could work on well, that. Well, I'm just looking at making sure, maybe that too, but maybe making sure that the apartment management knows that there is an ordinance, a rule in the city. Sure. And, and that way, when code enforcement, they go to these, these apartments, they can be able to hand that out. Sure. Or say, this okay, is the rules to the city yeah. as far as the order. So once a complaint is made, once code enforcement goes out there, there's a literature that to give to the apartment managers is what you're saying. Yeah, or okay. or just, just, you know, it not be a complaint, just that on their regular uh, duties and they're driving around and they have an apartment, or even the police, they have an apartment complex in their area to be able to hand that, go to the door. We can proactively educate, yeah. And, and, and give that to them so they don't know. Maybe sometimes you, these apartment people are out of state, you just got somebody in the office who's running it, they don't know themselves, so I would say have something that we can be able to knock on the door of the apartment complex manager, here's the ordinance here, uh, so you'll be informed. Yeah, yeah, All right. we'll work on that. Thank you. So, uh, question. So the code enforcement can go to an apartment complex, more than four units? Yes. Yes. Yes, yes they can go. But so in order for them to, in, in order for code enforcement to go into an apartment, someone has to invite them into the apartment. So if a, a tenant is in the apartment and they have a complaint about their unit being substandard, they have to invite code enforcement in. Code enforcement will document it they will they will provide um, a violation, but we also send it to the state. So, so yes. Thank you. Any more questions, Ms. Lockett? <laughs> Good to see you. you too. Okay, so I guess that's settled. Well, we'll see if it's settled. Hopefully it's settled. I, I trust, I trust, I trust that you will, so. Okay, that's all I needed. Thank you. Thank, Thank you. you. Good morning. Good morning. Connie Burton. I just want to say the reason we don't tell is because we know we don't receive justice. We don't get justice here. We don't get justice in the courthouse. So the community has tried to figure out how to resolve our own issues. One of the biggest problems that I want to speak to quickly is that the city should not be the one that controls the legal counsel of an independent counsel. The city and the mayor made a determination, even when choosing who the NAACP would send to represent the interests of the community, she would have a hand in that as well. So it's no independence around the board in this community. The very least this council can do is lift itself up with some real transparency and say that the citizens of this community should have a right to up or down that vote, and that council should be independently chosen by the Citizen Review Board. Nothing on your agenda today spoke to the NAACP issue. I would have respected the administration that if you didn't want to give the NAACP any money, don't give it to them. For so long, the NAACP has been able to work with a limited budget. And so now what we see happening, before a dime, a dollar has been spent, again, the administration has hired outside sources to do their work. It's awful. It's hypocritical. The community is suffering, whether it is around the issue of not having affordable housing in East Tampa. All we see now in East Tampa is a flurry of houses that we will never be able to purchase. $300,000, $450,000 next to houses that need what? Real rehab, and we can't get that done. For the last five years, we've been trying to push 
a rehab uh, bill that is almost like a shell game. It is not being done. So what I'm believing now is an undermining attempt to remove all poor people out of East Tampa. Because it's the closest they could be to Ebor, the Riverwalk, Friends of the River, whatever you want to call it, we're not enjoying any of the benefit. The person that has had the shortest membership of the NAACP receive a suspension from the national. You know why? Because that national is not going to allow a Michelle Patty to control the NAACP. Mm. That's real. So hopefully you don't get caught up in it and let the NAACP and its legal counsel deal with the Michelle Patties of this world. Thank you. Please. Thank you. Robinson. Yeah, I have the documents. First of all, answer. those documents received and filed in the public records by the uh, city council uh, whenever y'all accept those. So I want those received and filed. First of all, I want to say that I'm Joe Robinson and I'm not a convicted felon. Do not let convicted felons sit here and tell you what taxpayers that pay their taxes want or don't want. I'm not a convicted felon. I'm not a convicted felon. Whom the gods destroy, they first make angry. Charlie is right on this first subject about water issues. And I want to say that let the science, the professional engineers, the people that know about water dictate this, not politics. Let's look at possibly, like they said, changing Senate Bill 64. No issue there. The reason that everybody's arguing about it is because we were saying that the statute says we got to do something, we got to do something. Well, let's try to change the statute. That's a compromise. Otherwise, I sat on Swift Mud Basin Board for nine and a half years, know all about water, reclaim water, put all the money over there for the city to even get to where they at. 20 years ago, right, Charlie? Now, let's get to why I'm here. I'm here because I'm requesting city council make a motion that Tampa City Council should request for a forensic audit of the NAACP Hillsborough <laughs> County Branch's finances and that it be provided to them by the NAACP Hillsborough County Branch at the branch's expense. And that Sanford City Council should request an audit be performed by the city auditor on funds given to the NAACP Hillsborough County Branch for the last three years before the 2023 budget $100,000 be released to the NAAC Hillsborough County Branch. The reason for the budget request of to the City of Tampa Council for a Rented Audit of the finances from the NAAC Hillsborough County Branch and that the Tampa City Council request an audit be performed by the City Audit on funds given to the NAAC Hillsborough County Branch for the last three years is because it is the Tampa City Council responsibility for transparency and accountability, Mr. Carson, for taxpayer dollars being budgeted, received, and spent by nonprofit public charity entities when funds come from the city's budget. The attached press release dated November 16th that you all have, and I've asked to be received and filed, gives more reasons why this should be conducted. And if you look at the page, the second page of the audit request in yellow, in yellow, in yellow, in yellow, it says, quote, we were not engaged to and did not conduct an audit or review engagement, the objective of which would have been the expression of an opinion inclusion. So there was no audit done. It was a financial review and there's issues. And I take offense to anyone talking about Joe Ross for the FBI because the FBI will be invoked now because by saying what you said, 
You ask them to come investigate. Please do not be part of public corruption or aiding and abetting in this effort by the NAACP, not the organization, the public corrupt individuals. Thank you. Is there anyone else in chambers who wishes to speak during public comment? Mr. Chairman. Mr. Chairman. Councilman Goods. I didn't want to say anything, but uh, there's some issues that are happening over there, and it's unfortunate. That that's the longest black organization that stands up for the rights of people, as you all know. All people, no matter what. I did receive a message that the, the national office will be in town. I guess all the big wigs are coming in town. And they are, my understanding, they're going to have an open invitation. It's a bit closed meeting, I'm understanding to any and all elected officials to have any questions about anything in reference to the NAACP in general. So I don't know when that call is coming, but I do know within a week or so, a few weeks, they will be here uh, in Tampa to deal with any issues of the local branch uh, or any questions that people may have. And I was uh, informed of that. So, And with, will they be reaching out to us? My understanding that we're reaching out to elected right. officials who want to come in, want to ask any questions or whatever. So at that time, Maybe we, if anyone does have any question, they can ask the national office. I don't know which officers are coming. I just know the national mm -hmm. office is coming. I don't know if the president's coming or whoever, but I was informed that the national office is coming to Tampa uh, to, I guess, talk and see what's going on. Mr. Shelby. Yes, thank you. And thank you for uh, bringing that to council's attention. Councilman Goods, I would just ask, uh, I'm, based on just what I'm hearing, uh, I'd just like to be kept in the loop. With regard to that, I certainly don't want any have any sunshine issues. This is certainly something that's relevant to city council and something that's public business. So I want to make sure that everybody's bases are covered. So I'd appreciate your awareness and, and, and bringing it to my attention. Thank you. Is there anyone else in chambers who would like to make any comments during public comment? Seeing none, I believe we have three members, three people that wish to speak virtually. Mr. Randolph, are you there? Yes, good morning. How's everybody today? Um, I'm here for a follow-up to the meeting that we gave on October 31st, having to do with reducing street violence a national approach. Uh, health, public safety, and social economic development connecting the dots. We're going to do a follow-up meeting on December the 30th at 6 p.m., we got a lot of folks that's in the community that couldn't make that meeting, but they wanted us to do an evening meeting. So we're going to do that on top. December the 31st at 6 p.m. As you know, the level of violence is not stopping. Every time you read the newspaper, it increases. Our approach is using a hip hop approach that attracts, excites, educates, and transforms the hardcore youth on the corner. I'm asking everybody uh, that can attend that particular meeting and learn about what's going on around the country in terms of reducing the level of violence. I do want to personally thank uh, Councilwoman Hurtak for attending that meeting. I uh, appreciate that you attended that meeting, and that was a national meeting with people from around the country to talk about how to reduce violence. Thank you very much. Thank you. Ms. Schromar. <coughs> Good morning. Good morning. Um, yeah, my name is Jean Stremeyer, um, south of Gandy for 31 years, um, Tampa for 52 years. Um, I am calling, let's see, I'm just going to go over the agenda a little bit, but I was really shocked about number seven and that that, that was even on the agenda because y'all know, I mean, I cruise the agenda and I, I don't have time to go into each and every um, item, but when that was being discussed as I was coming back from walking my dog, I was absolutely shocked. Y'all see the email that I sent because I was really upset about that, not knowing based on what it said on the, the little board that y'all have. Anyway, so please make those more clear. I appreciate that. And on the agenda. Okay, so um, stormwater update. I'm going to listen to that unless y'all did it when I was walking my dog. I don't think so. Um, we have... Um, um, let's see, 10, Bloomberg, I am dying to hear that one. Um, number 11, Tenant Advocacy Report, I'm listening to that. And, but all these, number 13 and the other one that are requesting attorneys 
to represent them by our tax dollars. I'm just not okay with that. I don't. I just don't think, you know. And then, you know, I do believe the city council should be, you know, have um, their attorneys, uh, you know, separate based on what happened to uh, Councilman Dingfelder. I think um, not all these unelected groups need to have their own attorneys paid for by yours truly. I just, you know, I want y'all to pay for my attorney for anything I need. So I just don't think that's right. Um, let's see, Hillsborough River. I spoke with a guy about the Hillsborough River, and he used to work for Hillsborough County, scientist guy. And he says that the, the spraying that we do in the river to kill whatever is really bad for the river. He suggested that other cities are actually removing their dams. I don't know in the, as far as the minimum flows and all that. I don't know if that's an option or they're doing something to um, better that. But apparently there's two things I, it was brought to my attention recently. One is that we're using the, um, the river for what's it, heat, what's it called, um, energy um, that is heating up the river way too hot for the wildlife. And that heat is somewhat causing these um, algae blooms and things like that. But then, So there's two different issues that I spoke with with two different people um, about the water, and I'd like that looked into. So I think that's kind of it. And, um, yeah, thank you. Have a great day. Thank you. I also see Carol Ann Bennett is on the list. However, she is in the audience. So we, do we have anybody else online? Oh, yes, I'm sorry. Ms. Matz, are you there? Ms. Matz, please unmute yourself. Okay, thank you. Um, my name is Mary Matz, Mary Bill Matz, and I'm a native, and my educational background includes a master's in science in industrial hygiene with a minor in environmental sciences. And I'm a member of the Pure Stakeholder Group and a member of the Tampa Bay Sierra Club. And I'm speaking on item number seven. I support the recommendations laid out by Mr. Flannery in the document that you will soon receive and that is supported by the stakeholder group. I ask you to make a formal request to support legislation that includes recommendations in your 2023 legislative priorities. There is great potential for serious unintended consequences as the statute now reads. I will address the two recommendations from Mr. Flannery on Senate Bill 64. First of all, estuaries provide a nursery and habitat for important fish and shellfish species. It's it's common sense to see that stopping the discharge of a large amount of, of water flow into Tampa Bay that has been occurring for many, many years could critically harm our estuary system. A disturbing part of Senate Bill 64 is that it doesn't even address estuarine bodies of water that would be impacted. New legislation must be proposed that addresses these missing elements. Also, item two, we live in Florida. Excuse me, still item seven, six, seven, but another point is that we live in Florida and we all know that there are large fluctuations in rainfall throughout the year, creating variations in our hydrologic conditions. As well, we also know our water quality fluctuates depending on many factors, both industrial and environmental. With a fixed amount of effluent to be repurposed, conditions such as summer rains plus the 50 million gallons of water per day might overwhelm a surface or groundwater system that accepts that extra water. It's just common sense to allow for variations in quantities of effluent discharge to be rerouted or reused. And I'm asking you to please support legislation that includes these recommendations in your 2023 legislative priorities. And thank you for your time. Thank you. Do we have anyone else online? Thank you, Ms. Suling. Ms. Travis. Good morning. Good morning. We are going to pull agenda item number 41 for discussion at your request. 
Yes. So good morning, Council. Nicole Travis, Administrator of Development and Economic Opportunity. Uh, it is absolutely my pleasure to bring Mr. David Ingram uh, to you for confirmation and requesting a residency waiver as our new Executive Director of the Tampa Convention Center. I ask that you expeditiously confirm him so that he doesn't run away after sitting here this morning. <laughs> Um, and so David um, spent most of his, he is a Tampa native, went to high school in Tampa, went to USF, go Bulls. Go Bulls. Go Bulls. And um, David has spent most of his hospitality career over at the Orlando Convention Center as recently as general manager acting, um, I'm probably going to butcher it. It's fine. I'm butchering it acting executive director, and he has worked his way up um, to do great things in Orlando. We're ecstatic that he's here. His first day was on Monday, so council, I appreciate it. Some of you have met with David already, um, and some have put some uh, calendar appointments uh, to meet with him in the future. So thank you for your indulgence, and David Ingram. Mr. Reagan, would you like to take a couple of minutes and share your words? Sure. Uh, first and foremost, thank you so much for this confirmation. It's a pleasure being back in uh, Tampa. I've been surrounded by black and gold for the last uh, 20 years, so it's good to be back in uh, green and gold country. Um, I'd also like to thank my staff that's actually here today. They did a, they've done a great job of welcoming me. Um, it's been such a great experience coming in. I'm looking forward to working with all of you. Anything that you need, feel free to reach out to me uh, once I get my uh, cell phone and everything settled. I'll be more than happy to take care of anything that you need. If you have any questions, feel free. Councilman Maniscalco. Thank you very much. Um, I had the pleasure of meeting with you the other day, and uh, you have a very, very impressive background and resume. I think, uh, and I, I know you'll hit the ground running with the experience that you have, the people that you've worked with and for, uh, and in the different communities. So we're, we're glad that you're here, and we wish you the best of luck. Thank you. Appreciate it. Councilwoman Hurtak. Um, welcome. We're really thrilled to have you. Can't wait. Uh, we know we've got some renovations going on, so we're already excited about what's going and uh, really looking forward to having some fresh eyes. And uh, I, you, I'm so glad your team was able to come. They all look very happy. So uh, I'm uh, congratulations and I look forward to meeting with you and talking to you about how uh, you're going to make our wonderful convention center even better. Thank you very much. If it wasn't for them, I, I wouldn't be successful without the staff. So it's truly all on them. Exactly. Thank, Thank you very much, Mr. Chairman. Mr. Ingram, congratulations. Uh, you've been here for an hour and 45 minutes. And you got more in that hour and 45 minutes than anyone here could ever put into your head. And uh, I know you come from a convention center. It's about six times larger than ours. It's over a million. Ours is about 220,000 square feet. I can tell you that by experience, you're very smart because you didn't mention which high school? Gaither High School. I never heard of them. What? Oh, what? Uh, <laughs> you said Go Falcons. No, that's, uh, I understand that. I'm only joking with you. Uh, I come from JE and it's not Jesuit. You figure that one out. But any appreciate very much your sincerity and your work here. I know 20 some years ago we lost one of our second in command at the convention center to your convention center. Now that convention center, we're getting one here, so now we're even. Congratulations <laughs> and being friendly, Tampa. Thank you. Buenos para la de Tampa. Thank you. I, I actually, I have um, just a quick story. Uh, for Orange County, I actually had to sit through a three hour public comment before they went to consent agenda. So this, is, this was pretty easy today. Oh. <laughs> I hate to live where you come from. <laughs> yeah. Councilman Goods. Well, you come highly recommended. Uh, Ms. Travis is excited uh, of, of you coming here, and apparently you've already hit the ground running, my understanding. Uh, normally, we, I like to meet the candidates before we come here, but Ms. Uh, Travis said that uh, they called my office, but I didn't get a chance to get back. So I apologize for not getting a chance to personally meet with you because I like to meet the candidates before <coughs> I make a vote. But I trust Mrs. Travis' uh, recommendation. And apparently, you know, when I look at the Orlando area, I always say that, you know, Tampa's growing, but we're still kind of behind the times with, with Orlando a little bit, so the things they've got going on. But we're trying to catch up. And I think with your expertise of having large conventions to bring a great economic impact to that, that area, I think with your, your knowledge, it's going to happen here. Uh, you know, everyone goes to Orlando for conventions. You know, we finally get my fraternity. will be the first one to have a big conclave here next year and some of the other furniture attorneys are by, uh, right behind us so we're glad to see that we are moving in the right direction and hopefully you'll get us to that top pinnacle like orange orange county is 
Thank you. As long as I have your support, we'll be able to move that forward. Thank you. Councilman Carlson. Yeah, I've spent a lot of time in the Orlando Convention Center and um, you know, impressive property run very well. Um, I haven't had a chance to meet you. I think we've got something on the calendar. We're trying to schedule something, but I also trust Nicole's um, judgment on it. And, <coughs> um, and I've seen your background information. It looks very impressive. Um, my only request is that you uh, help us bring Star Wars Celebration over or put us in rotation. I know we're too small for it, but there are other there are other venues we can work with to make it happen. So let's work together and get that, please. I'm a big Star Wars fan as well. I, I, I've actually uh, worked that show twice when I was in Orlando. So we'll see what we can do. <laughs> uh, Mr. Ingram, uh, congratulations. What a time to prove yourself. You've got renovations and remodelings going on. You've got the holiday seasons. Jump, jump in the water. It's fine. Welcome, welcome aboard. Move 41. You want to go ahead and move it now? Yes, sir. Got a motion made by Councilman uh, Miranda, seconded by Councilman Maniscalco. All in favor say aye. 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 Is there any opposed? Congratulations. Thank you. I appreciate it. If you don't mind, I'm going to take the staff back to work. Yes, get, get them back to work, will Thank you? you? <laughs> Thank you. Thank you, sir. Okay. Um, the next item I have for you. Um, Thank you, guys. Thank you. Um, the next item I have for you is a walk-on item. I've spoken to each of you about um, this item. This is a memorandum of, an ag of agreement between Belmar Partners LLP um, and the city of Tampa. What it is is that we're asking, um, this property has a historic structure on it. It is a national uh, landmark. It is not locally designated. It's not in a historic district here. Um, but because of that, in order for the property to be redeveloped, um, there has to be a noticing uh, period for 30 days um, that the de demolition of the historic structure is going to take place and that the redevelopment of that property would be 100 affordable housing units. Um, this came to you back in 2021 in your action plan. It recently came in an agreement um, sometime over the summer uh, for you to for that funding agreement and our participation in this affordable housing project. And so I, we don't like to do walk-ons unless they're time sensitive um, and considering that this is affordable housing project and the week of Thanksgiving, we found out the date of the closing in January. So in order for us to keep that closing date, um, we're respectfully asking for your approval of this memorandum of agreement so that we can continue to move on forward with this redevelopment project. Councilman Mascarco. Thank you very much, Ms. <coughs> Travis. As much as I hate demolishing anything of historic significance, I drive by this. This has nothing, will not affect my decision. I drive, I drive by this every day when I take my stepdaughter to school. And it's one of those mid-century structures. I've even photographed it and put it on social media of all the churches in the area because it's a heavily populated area. However, uh, I don't know, you know, how the, you know, the, the story of the church, the congregation, how long it's been in, inoperable, whatever. But the bright side is, again, uh, you know, I'm about historic preservation, but the bright side is 100, <coughs> even though we need 10,000 or more affordable use in, uh, units, this uh, moves us forward towards that goal of providing affordable housing in a, in an area that is very desirable in a good part of town. And so, you know, I understand the, the trade off here as much as I am hesitant and I hate to see anything demolished, but it's for a good public purpose uh, and, a, you know, severe necessity that we, we obviously need with affordable housing. So yeah, thank and, you. and to your point, um, I'm a preservationist at heart. And so the memorandum of agreement has stipulations in it that requires before um, Belmar is able to demolish the property that they have to document, archive, take pictures. The, the, the historic preservation, the state historic preservation office um, have strict requirements in documenting historical structures. Um, I've been through that several times on other projects and it is very detailed. You have to have a specific photograph type of um, camera to document all of the history of the church before it's ultimately de demolished. So that's outlined, those stipulations are outlined 
and has to have to be completed before they can demo the property. Thank you. Any other comments or questions? <laughs> Councilman Miranda. Move to a walk on. Second. Point of procedure, please. If this was not on the agenda, would there be comments for public? Would comments? you please come 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 to the front and ask your questions so they can be heard for the record? Mr. Shelby. Yes, sir. Uh, if this is going to be uh, something that the council is going to be voting on, um, that is a walk on. Was it on the addendum? Yes. 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 It was on the addendum, so the public did have the opportunity. Was it um, available? That the yes. Yes. I, I, yes, that would yeah. be my recommendation. Well, motion made by Councilman Maniscalco, seconded by Councilman Hurtag. All in favor? All right. At this time, we will take public comment concerning the walk on agenda item. Bob Whitmore with City Tree. <clears throat> Um, this feels like it's being slipped under the uh, door a little bit to me. Um, I am not aware of the situation, um, but it is a, it is a, a historic property, I assume, or, or there may be trees on this property that may need to be taken into consideration. There's an awful lot of questions, I think, that the public would have before we actually just press head and saying, you know, I didn't like the looks of that, so let's take it down. So if, if this deems to be important enough to have somebody come inside and archive it for history, perhaps there is some history that needs to be preserved by keeping this building or, or considering, at least put it into consideration so that we, we can actually just give it some real, real good thought and, and some public scrutiny. That is, that is all I ask. Travis. Yes, Council, thank you. I'm going to put on an Elmo and Ariel of the property. Um, just for Council's awareness, the development, the agreement for to develop this property has already been approved by Council. This is simply the memorandum of agreement that requires the developer to take pictures of the historic structure prior to the demolition. It has already been approved as a development agreement. In your action plan, you've approved the, the development agreement already. This is just a procedural of the documentation as we don't want to just, the state is asking us to do this, to document the building. Otherwise, the building will be demolished without any photographs. So there's no slipping anything through. Is there any other public comment? We have a motion to close by Councilman Maniscalco, seconded by Councilman Goose. All in favor? Aye. There is still a motion Councilman, made by Councilman Maniscalco, seconded by Councilman Miranda. No, no Miranda. 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 Made by yeah. Councilman Miranda, seconded by yeah. Councilman yeah. Maniscalco. Before we go that, all these comes after, all the things about trees and all come before you knock down anything. You, before you build, you've got to have a plan. Which That's correct. Build. You this have to have an approved site plan. That's right. correct. There's a process to go through. Um, if there were... If the, if the, once the developer is ready to move forward, they have to have an approved site plan, um, and all of that would be mitigated for if Correct. that is the case. All in favor say aye. Aye. Is there any opposed? Thank you, Ms. Travis. Does that take care of all the walk-ons and the Yes. Pulled? I just have one note. Um, when you guys approve the agenda, um, item number 39 has a continuance on it, and that's related to the CRA that... Um, we didn't take care of. 39. And so 39, uh, because our November meeting was canceled. To continue to December, December 15th. 15th. That's correct. Second. 39 to December 15th. We have a motion made by Councilman Maniscalco, seconded by Councilman Moran, uh, no, Hurtak. Councilwoman Hurtak. All in favor say aye. 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 Any opposed? I saw a, a face of confusion. That's just because procedurally it needs to go to the CRA first. first. So thank you for your indulgence. Let the record reflect that Councilman Vieira is with us in person now, because I know he was listening on his phone. Okay. Agenda item number two. Good morning, Council. Adri Colina, Director of Logistics and Asset Management. I am here um, on item number two, and it is a pretty straightforward request of you. Uh, it is to extend the contract that we have 
with our vendor, ManCon, who is our parts supplier in our facility, in our fleet uh, maintenance division. I provided you with a detailed memo of our request, and I've also spoken with you each individually. But I certainly wanted to make myself available today to answer any questions you may have. Simply put, it's extending the contract. It's a um, contract that originated in 2014. It was a five-year contract with five uh, allowable one-year extensions. I am asking today for you to approve the second to the last extension. I'm also asking for an allowable 8.5% CPI increase, which is allowed in the contract, and right-sizing it to add one um, customer service person in our fleet maintenance area that services our fire uh, team. Any comments or questions? Move the resolution. Second. We have a motion by Councilman Maniscalco, seconded by Councilwoman Hurtak. All in favor? Uh -huh. Is there any opposed? Thank you. Thank you all. Agenda item number three. Good morning, Council. Good morning. Uh, Brad Baird, Deputy Administrator of Infrastructure. I'm here um, to request approval for four contracts associated with uh, citywide meter, <laughs> hydrant, and valve installation and replacement um, uh, to the tune of six and a half million dollars each for a total of $26 million. Um, I uh, very much appreciate uh, Councilman Goods asking me to speak uh, briefly on this because, um, as you know, the administration uh, has put uh, a focus on diversity, equity, and inclusion, and um, the entire administration has worked very hard on increasing uh, EBO participation, and uh, this contract shows uh, the fruits of our labor. Um, we uh, have as much as 26.1 participation on one of the contracts, and the other contracts are um, very have very good participation as well. So um, I appreciate your support on it. Councilman Mascaco. Uh First, thank you, and uh, I'm glad to see this and the numbers that you were just discussing. I'm glad Councilman Goods brought this up because it's a this is equity. This is a hand up in the community and lifting uh, people up because is this part of pier? I'm sorry, pier. Uh, pipes. I'm sorry, pipes. Okay, not the, the 2016 stormwater, but multi-billion dollar uh, program. Yep. There's more than enough money to go around to uh, help benefit minority groups, people in the community, and this is a perfect example. And this is not the first because you've brought up contract after contract with increased and and impressive minority participation numbers so we're very grateful for that so thank you for listening to us because i know this was brought up by the council and um these are the results that people want to see so thank you sir thank you councilman hurtak um i want to echo um councilman maniscalco's uh um congratulations for this but i also wanted to just highlight the fact that you're using four um we talked about this in um the briefing and uh, you said that you didn't think that you would get this many people participating but I, I love it because it means that when something happens in the middle of the night we have not just one person we can call we have four different entities so um, I think that's really wonderful I'm, uh, and you said that we've worked with all four of these before so we already know the quality of the work and so I just want to say thank you for for not only including um, or getting great EBO numbers, but also just including more um, organizations in this. I think that's a really exciting way to go forward, and I just want to say congratulations. Thank you. Councilman Goods. Well, Brad, we want to say thank you. Uh, you know, we're catching up. Uh, I was invited to a gala last night of diversity and inclusion of uh, contractors and developers. Uh, they invited me to this gala last night at the Italian Club, actually. And I don't know why Hillsborough wasn't there, but Orange County came here, some of their elected officials, some of their contractors, their EBO office, uh, Osceola, uh, Pinellas. Uh, and as they were doing their schematic uh, and talking about what they're doing, I mean, we're catching up to them, but we're still a little bit behind, but I'm glad that we're moving. Uh, but I can tell you, uh, Orange County, uh, they have the best plan I ever seen. I'm, I'm going to be honest with you. 
Uh, and I was going to talk to O.C. about that. I mean, and they do with Ms. Hertek's son. They, they combine a lot of different entities to get it done. They combine a lot of different entities to get it done and get those numbers. And they don't, they don't, uh, and, and in their, almost all their verbiage is, it's not that good faith, it's shall. Mm -hmm. It's not good faith, it's shall. And people know when they go to put in that bid, they, they make sure that they have what it takes to do it. And what I like about it, they have trained to make sure folks, like I, I talked about it, sometimes you have smaller businesses they don't know the lingo and language. They don't have the money for the big time attorneys. So they get left out a lot of times, but they have a training program to where they have those smaller yeah. businesses come in to learn how to do the contract, to understand the verbiage, the language <laughs> of how to get a procurement, what that really means. But the biggest thing they talked about, and I've said this from day one, that sometimes a challenge, and they, they've been working on that, and a few other counties were talking about it, is the bond issue. Mm -hmm. Because the small guy can't get the, the nice big job because he can't get the bond. He doesn't have the capital. Yeah. So that's something that I, I'm still going to preach for us to try to work on. How can we find a program? And, and I know Mr. Moran has been working on that, but we, to, to deal with that. And that way we can be able to help those smaller guys and get a multitude of those folks to be able to get what I call not be hungry and have a seat at the table. So I'm glad that we're, we're putting our foot forward. We got a little ways to go, but I'm glad of the numbers that are happening now, and I know the community be happy. And by the way, the gentleman, I did uh, on the same note, I did go by, uh, was invited out to the the uh, Hannah project. Mm -hmm. uh, I think maybe all of you to take a tour out there. Uh, mm -hmm. and we had a lot of controversy, and I know some things, you know, wasn't done the way we what this board think it should have been done, mm -hmm. and that's just the way that is. But I think the company is understanding and trying to get there to what this council wants. Yeah. Um, I saw a lot of HBCU graduates out there working on this project in major positions. Yeah. And I was impressed upon it. I was impressed. I'm not a family guy. I'm a Cookman man. But you know, we had a lot of HBCU workers out there <coughs> doing really, uh, I, I call it work that I, I can't do. Uh, you know, you need to have the expertise to do. So I was happy to see that uh, that company, DPR, is hearing and, and got uh, uh, Ducon and some of those guys on the yeah, there are four, four different projects out there. So you can see how it's being developed. And Ducon's getting ready to start this, I think, this week to yep. that back end. So, and that's a whole minority uh, firm. Yes. So I'm really happy with that. So I'm, I'm glad that the administration is listening. And, and again, we just need to keep moving and still look and see what other people are doing so we can improve and say, hey, we're, we're matching everybody else. But again, thank you for the effort. Thank you. Councilman Miranda. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, I just want to say that I had a couple of calls last night regarding one of your developers at. Uh, they were having coffee at West Hampton Sandwich Shop and they were looking at the work that was being done. And to their surprise, whoever was there told them, come here, I'm gonna show you. And they showed them the whole thing, how the pipe goes in an inch at a time through the other pipe. And they were amazed that they got about a 20, 30 minute a session learning and seeing how they're putting a pipe inside of a pipe. And they were just at, at all that this things could happen. I said, that's technology, baby, that's mm -hmm. all that is. But I appreciate everything and whoever the developer was, tell them thank you on behalf of uh, the citizen of West Tampa that they had the time to show them what they were doing, how they do it. Councilman Mascalco. Uh, a, a question to uh, Councilman Goods because we can't talk privately. So you went up to the Hanna project. What did you notice in regards to, uh, we have the apprenticeship ordinance and whatnot. What did you notice in regards to the participation there? I didn't get too much in that. I know that they, they've got some folks out there. Um, I, 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 I know that we are stuck on the state certification for apprenticeship program, and I'm, and I'm grateful for that. But when I see guys walking down the street and they need guys to work, I like guys to be able to come in and apply to work, get them on the site, get them working, and then let, let them be able to be a part of the state certification and those type of things. But I don't want a guy who's hungry that he's got to wait to go try to find a way to get certified. If we got some people that need to work, let them work, get them into the apprenticeship program to be cert certified. That way they can feed their families. But I was impressed that they're starting to get folks. And I told them, and I don't know if it's the city portion of water, but I told them people are visual learners sometimes. People, when they see things, they believe things. And I told them they need to, they need to film the project. Mm -hmm. Film some of those HBCU guys in there drawing up the plans and drawing this stuff. I mean, show the people that you have people from that community. A couple of guys that's just strategists, or they call them whatever, uh, they, they're actually got the computers that are working. They're actually making sure that 
that part is supposed to fit where it's supposed to go and things like that. I was amazed at what I saw and filmed that you got people from that community on the project working. And I'm like, why are we not doing that to show what's happening? Even though we had a lot of scuttlebutt that was going on, let's begin to tell the story of the Hannah Project for the community mm -hmm. and making sure you got, again, those faces so people can recognize and say, hey, I know him. I taught him at school. or he's, He lived out of the street. He's working on that big project. He helped develop this. We can't be afraid to show those type of things. And we need to have our CTV, whoever does our stuff here, out there filming the project as it goes, showing that you have all types of minorities working on this project and that we're starting to give everybody an opportunity and a piece of the pie. Yes. Move the resolution. All right. Thank you very much. A motion by Councilman Maniscalco, seconded by Councilman Miranda. All in favor? All right. Any opposed? Thank you. Thank you. Agenda item number five. Good morning, City Council. Jean Duncan, Administrator for Infrastructure and Mobility. I believe Vic Vitti is on the line, but this is a quarterly report that we submit that generally doesn't have discussion. We're happy to have any discussion. But it's basically a summary of active stormwater projects that are being done under the assessment that Councilman Montescalco mentioned a minute ago. Uh, it was approved some years ago. I believe it was 2016. Uh, Mr. B. Day, are you there? Yes, sir. Morning, Council. Uh, Vic B. Day, Director of Mobility Department. Sorry about that. Uh, I'm here to address any questions you may have about item five. Uh, a memo with the quarterly report was submitted to Council for review. Uh, as was uh, required by motion a few years back. Councilman Goods. Good morning, Vic. Uh, the only problem I have, well, I, I just want us to be able to fix a problem that I think there is. When we go out and we tear up these roads and we go to put them back, could we make sure the road is drivable? Because I, I called you. I, I, wanted to, I wanted to file a lawsuit and say, you, you tore my Cadillac up because I rode down that Florida Avenue road that was redone. I almost tore up the, the end of my car up. So I don't understand, and, and I don't know what the process is, but I do have a problem. We go out and we tear up a road, and we don't fix the road. I mean, we just do a, a, a patch-up job of a road. I have a problem with that. So I don't know if that needs to be incorporated in the dollars and cents to make sure that when you tear up a road, that the road is drivable so people don't tear their cars up. I mean, it's, it's a serious problem. And every time I go down these places and I see we've gone in and did great work for the underground, but the top layer, it, it, I, I have a problem with that. I, I think we, gotta, we, we have to address that. We have to make sure that the road is properly paved and, and done right. Uh, if that has to be included into the project, but I'm just sorry, we've got to fix that problem. Uh, Councilman, I understand, and I, I remember the concern you had cited on Florida Avenue regarding that. The, the challenge there was that with, so first to clarify, with every stormwater project, if we do tear up a road, uh, it is in the scope to put it back and resurface it. Usually the road is opened up for laying pipe and so on, which was the case on Florida. Sometimes what happens is there's additional work that needs to be done. And so we don't completely uh, uh, repave or resurface the street until all work that needs to be done on the pavement is done. But we will be mindful of your concern and I'll make sure that I work with both uh, our, our projects team and contract administration to make sure that the roadway surface, even if it is interim, is uh, safe and good to drive. Even on the non-Ontarios, I mean, you know, I mean, I, I just think, you know, I mean, to me that creates hazards for people with, with bumps and, and gouges. I think, you know, it, it needs to be properly done regardless if we got to come back. But my thing is, let's, let's make sure that it, at least we have a smooth surface. Uh, you may not get all your layers, but so people can actually drive on the car, they don't have an accident because I can tell you, man, I was on that road, I called you right away. I said, man, this is, this is unacceptable. But, but thank you for at least addressing it. Yes, sir. 
Councilman Maniscalco. Thank you very much. Uh, Councilmember Goods, uh, we are in receipt of, of the complaint of the road. You're, you're, not, the, you're not the first person. A gentleman, uh, a gentleman named Neil sent some photos a couple of hours ago, and uh, my aide was already going to contact the contractor and reach out to everybody. I know exactly what you're talking about. You're talking about right, right in front of the bakery? Yeah, so uh, we're working on it. Our office is uh, reaching out to the contractor, but uh, as Mr. Bide has, has said, you know, they – they did the road work. They paved how they paved it in order to open the road. But once it's complete, it'll be fixed. This happened on Himes and the interstate near the Midtown project, where we, the city, came in and redid Himes, beautifully paved. Then they had to tear up parts of the road, and it was like a temporary fix. It was awful. You could see the the patches in the road. And then they came over and they did it right. So if you go down there now, it's smooth. But it was a similar situation like Ford Avenue, but. Again, my aide was reaching out to the contractor a little bit ago and uh, to get that taken care of. Councilman Carlson. Yep. Uh, one other thing, um, I talked to Vic about this last night, but um, um, as we're doing these projects, I know the idea of putting uh, stormwater and transportation under Vic so that we could have coordination and then all of that, including potable water, is under Gene. Um, <clears throat> last night we had a, another kind of Carmageddon south of Gandhi where um, uh, three roads, I think, were closed at the same time, and um, maybe two of them by the city and one by another party. But um, the only thing, without getting the specifics of this, um, I got a lot of emails and calls, and anything we can do to um, try to help plan with other agencies the impact on the, uh, the residents, especially if, if during rush hour and, uh, it, and if multiple roads are being uh, taken out and I know Vic is working hard to correct this specific problem but just anything we can do to avoid that because traffic is already bad enough and I think we just we figured out a couple years ago the whole city of Tampa is in a transportation concurrency exception area and so we're 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 at risk everywhere if we start shutting down roads thank anyone else thank you councilman uh chair if I may address that yes, real sir. quick uh and councilman, thank you uh, again for your support on that. Uh, we are ensuring that, you know, that will not happen again today. Yesterday's uh, occurrence was regretful. Uh, we had permitted the construction to be completed before rush hour. Uh, I'd like to clarify that. So we did anticipate, you know, the need for traffic flow during rush hour. It's likely that because of the weather last evening, some of that work might have been delayed. Uh, but going forward, we are cognizant that at any given time, we have 400 work zones uh, within the city. And so we're investing in a more advanced uh, platform to manage work zones that will basically be two-way information so we can in real time manage what's going on on the street. Uh, rather than having to depend on a whole lot of technicians driving around the city. Having said that, we're also increasing the number of technicians. So we're aware of this challenge, but growing rapidly, and, uh, and we're doing all we can to address it. Thank you very much, Mr. Bide. We look forward to your next report on this, March 16th, 2023. Thank you. Thank you. Agenda item number seven. <coughs> Good morning, Council Chair. Uh, Chuck Weber, Water Department Director. Uh, I think uh, Brad Bear just handed out uh, the documentation that was requested earlier. It's just one page front and back communication. Uh, I'd like to start by addressing uh, some of the comments that were made earlier, just to point out some clarifications. Uh, the city is not proposing a $6 billion project. In fact, as it stands today, th there is no project to vote no on or yes. Uh, so uh, there's no uh, proposed two to three times percent rate increase. That, that's not what we're addressing. Um, so I think uh, some of the comments about public outreach I need to uh, respond to. Uh, we haven't addressed those 17 questions yet. And though I appreciate the, the community outreach that has been done regarding the project, the, 
the facts have not been, from those 17 questions, have not been delivered to the public, and, and we need to do that. That's an important part of the project. Uh, th those questions surround safety and costs of the project, and we need to get out and give that information. The reason we haven't given that information so far is that when the current uh, scope of uh, engagement with the consultant was approved in February, that scope that was brought to the February board was to evaluate two alternatives. Council, when they approved that, asked us to evaluate all the alternatives from the Juturna report, which was a, more like five. So when we went back to redo the scope so that we could address five of those options instead of two, we came back in July and that's when council continued to September and then <laughs> ultimately declined to approve that scope. That's why public outreach has not been done at the level that it really needs to do. That's why we haven't really uh, engaged on the 17 questions. But there's hope. We have the workshop scheduled in uh, January with stakeholders and then uh, in February with council where we're going to address those 17 questions. We're gonna address questions like cost and questions uh, like safety. And so uh, during that conversation, uh, I'm hopeful that we can resolve some of those questions. Um, there is uh, a challenge with some of the questions because extensive engineering work needs to be done before some of them can really be answered directly. Like exactly how much is this going to cost? Is it going to cost a few million? Is it going to cost a hundred million? What's the life cycle cost? We won't be able to nail that down until we do some engineering work. And in order to do that, we're going to need funding. But when we do the workshops in January, we're going to focus on here's the need for the project. So the one need that we've been talking about today a lot is the, um, you know, the, the need to comply with Senate Bill 64. And uh, I really appreciate the work that Sid Flannery did and working with him for the past two to three months on this and the engagement with the stakeholders. I thought we had some really good conversations about uh, how to best use water. And water in, in, uh, in the city of Tampa is a very complex thing. It's not an easy, um, you, you can't make a one narrow focus decision regarding wastewater and it not affecting potable water or storm water and it not affecting something else. So we need to look at water as a water resources holistically. And so as we move forward with these conversations, I'm hopeful uh, that we'll be able to do that so that we don't make a, a narrow minded focus decision that ends up costing us in one area or more in another because we haven't considered the overall effect. So with that in mind, there are two other drivers for the project. Uh, one of them is Sulphur Springs is becoming saltier. And we use that as a source of minimum flows for the Lower Hillsborough River. And the indication we're getting from uh, the Southwest Florida Water Management District is that we may need to replace that. And it is the major source. So if we replace uh, that source of water in, in, in any other way, there'll be a cost associated with it but it will also affect other areas of water management within the city. So we, we do need to address that issue. There's also the issue of drought. When we hit a really severe drought, uh, we can purchase water from Tampa Bay Water and it has been successful in the past. Um, that is an option. Uh, to rely on it moving in the future, we need to look at uh, cost of continued reliance on that. Uh, so uh, um, I didn't want to go too deep into those issues today because I'm really excited about discussing them in detail in January and February at the workshop. Um, so uh, with that, I guess uh, I'll answer any questions you have. Councilman Goods. I guess what bothers me about this whole water situation is that there's no solution. But I'm hearing from uh, a 30-year expert and I always say experience is your, is your best teacher. He's a scientist. Uh, and I look at the, those are the facts. That data, you can skew data. You can make data work off stats all day long. But we ask somebody who knows the actual subject matter, it makes a difference. And to, want to, for me to hear that when we make rules on this diocese, sometimes the ordinance just doesn't fit sometimes. We have to go back and kind of tweak it. So what I'm hearing is that the state statute needs to be tweaked. And maybe when those legislators did it, they, they did a blanket, whatever, but that doesn't fit everybody now. So my thing is, why, why, why we don't just pump the brakes right now? Let's get our lobbyists or hire our lobbyists to go to Tallahassee, 
to be able to find out in lobby to say this needs to be tweaked or whatever. It seems that there's some ambiguities here, that there's some issues here, and let them work that out and then come back and try to work. But to me, to try to keep putting our foot on the gas here, we, we're not getting to a stop sign here. I, I understand what you're saying, Councilman. Uh, but I, I would stress that Senate Bill 64 is, is an issue that certainly can be addressed that way. But the other two issues need to be addressed as well. And we have time for that. And, and that's why I'm looking forward to discussing why, why do we need to do this at the workshop in January and February. I think it would be good discussion, uh, engaging with the stakeholders. And you know, there are very many experts in this field, uh, people with 30 years of, of experience and more that we're going to bring to the workshop. To and have I, have no, Chuck, I have no problem with that. But my thing is right now is that we have a problem here. We can still talk and, and about whatever, whatever the, 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 the three different, five different categories of whatever, whatever. But right now, I have a problem here with the law. So we need to fix the law or let the legislation know there's an issue with the law of the interpretation. I've got charter amendments here that some of our interpretations are wrong, and we have to fix to make them right so people can understand what the exact uh, verbiage should be or what the order should be to be carried out. So I, I'm going to be asking that we look at making sure that the legislative body takes this to Tallahassee to say, look at your law. We need to do that as a city because, again, one, one size doesn't fit all. So we need to make sure that we'll be able to fit within this law where we need to be at. So I'm going to be asking that we take this before the legislature or have our lobbyists go before them to see how we can make sure that it, it's going to work and, and, and it's tweaked. So that's what I'm going to be looking for. I understand, Councilman. Uh, time time is, is important uh, with Senate Bill 64 um, squeezing a, a project in uh, that we haven't decided on yet in 10 years is going to be tough. I mean, that's the time driver for that. The time driver for the minimum flows is actually quite a bit closer. Uh, even in two weeks, we're going to be meeting with SWIFTMA to talk about our water use permit, permit renewal. And the minimum flows are definitely tied to that per permit renewal. And having a, a, a solution for Sulphur Springs will, will be essential to addressing concerns with the permit at the time. Again, no issue with that, John. I don't have a problem with that. You're still going to work on that. I have no problem. The problem I have is you still have to address the bigger issue. You're still going to have people come and complain this and that until we can address this. We can still work and talk and meet and give ideas, whatever, but again, we still have a main issue with the law, and that's what I'm seeing and hearing. So we have to address the law. So I'm hoping that we, 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 we don't go on deaf on ears on that, that we go and we address the law. We can still work, but we need to address the law. Councilwoman Hurtak. Um, I, I agree. We, we definitely need to do both. Um, and I'm going to encourage all of uh, my colleagues to reach out to those um, uh, representatives in both the House and Senate up in Tallahassee to see what else we can do um, regarding that because I think that's very critical and we need to create some partnerships there in addition to getting our own um, a lobbying team working on that. Uh, and so I, we, we continued the item about the 17 questions until the 19th and from what I'm hearing we may not have complete answers to every question and I just um, want to say that I understand that and that I know you are going to be talking to the stakeholders somewhat before we bring that forward too. And just to make sure that we all understand that we can have as much of the answers as we can possibly do without spending extra money. So um, I want to say thank you for that. And I look forward to that session. And I'm going to encourage my um, fellow, the, my colleagues that um, right now, that session, January 19th, um, only has three staff reports that I see on it, and I would really appreciate if we could limit the additional staff reports we put on that day, because I have a feeling that's going to be a long discussion. Yep. So I just want to say that. Thank you. Thank you for, um, for everything. Thank you for, for the documentation as well. Councilor McCarls. <clears throat> I, I just want to say, Chuck, um, thank you for your candor and um, 
reliability of information. It's really different than the conversations a few years ago, and I appreciate the offline conversations. You all have been good at proactively working with me, but also with the stakeholders, and the fact that you all sent that letter and let um, Sierra Club and others participate so much, I think, is a good sign of objectivity. <clears throat> it is obvious, though, and folks in, in around the mayor have said they absolutely want this project, and so no matter how objective the the water department has become, the mayor's office wants this project, just like the last mayor wanted this project. And it's an irrational decision. It's not based on science. It's that they want this project. And um, and so I, I think that's the concern the public has is there's no rational basis for it. There are a lot of reasons that have been put forward, but there's no uh, rational basis. And there, there's some evidence at least that at least the prior administration used lobbyists to lobby for it. And when I asked the administration this round if we could use a lobbyist against it, they said no. So, um, and, and by the way, I don't know if you all have seen, but every time I make a comment now that somebody from the administration sends a correction. And just like the report that was supposed to get, be given this morning by the police department, the corrections may be factual, but they're using their own set of facts that don't exactly meet what the standard criteria for what should be used. A, <clears throat> the example here that uh, Chuck you gave, it, it is true that there is no project right now by, based on the votes of what we did before. However, if, if, we, if we don't change this law, I could ask you a whole bunch of questions, but if we don't change this law and, and we adhere to the law, then we will move forward with some kind of project. And, uh, and so that's why I think the things are related. Uh, we don't know how much the new project will cost because we don't know what it is. The only information we have is the information that was created two or three years ago, which said, uh, I don't remember the exact number, 2.1 to 6.3 billion, somewhere in that range, uh, looking at the options. We don't have any other updated information. Uh, when I started using that number, then I got a, uh, a, a long, scathing email from Ms. Duncan, which I don't believe she wrote because uh, she's a nice person, <laughs> but it said, you understand we've educated you, I'm paraphrasing, that, 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 that it, it's centered in the industry to only use capital costs, not total costs for 30 years. That's not true. And um, uh, we need to, when we do come up with a project, we need to look at the total costs over 30 years. But in the absence of any other data, all we can look at is, is somewhere between two and six billion dollars. We know from the pipes program that it was three billion dollars, uh, 2.9 billion, and we increased, we doubled the water rate. And so uh, that went from like $40 to $80, something like that average. And so if we increase it to six billion, worst case, it might add another $80 a month. Maybe that's not exactly right, but we, we don't have any other information right now. But the point is that if we move forward and we abide by this law, it's it, if, if we don't start fighting the law and fighting the project now, we're gonna end up in a place where we're gonna have to spend money and eventually we're gonna have to raise rates and that's what the public wants us to do. They also want us to protect the environment. The Sulphur Springs thing, I've said this before, they, it's like 11 or 12 MGD. Um, the simple solution in the short run is, is to stop pumping. We have to buy from Tampa Bay Water, but we stop pumping. And <clears throat> Swift Mud, at least, at least the last time I checked, had not done any modeling on what would happen when we stop pumping. And if we stop pumping for a certain period of time and it's, we still have saltwater intrusion, then we can look at some other kind of solution. But right now they haven't done any modeling otherwise. Minimum flows, um, if, if SWIFMA comes back and says we can only have 80 MGD instead of 82 MGD, then we have to buy whatever the rest is from Tampa Bay Water. So minimum flows is important, getting our permit is important, but it doesn't mean that our water supply is gonna be shut off. There are a lot of, Chuck did not do this, but that some people in the administration have been using scare tactics, saying water is scarce in the future, water is our most important uh, 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 resource. That's right, that's why Tampa Bay Water in our region is the one of the best, and, and Ms. Miranda's on the board, is one of the best examples of regional cooperation, regional planning in the world. And, um, and so we should work with them on that and not kill it. Um, what <clears throat> What's happened in the past is that the lobbyists of the city, because they report to the mayor, uh, the last two mayors have used them to lobby in favor of this, it appears. Um, I, if we pass a resolution today asking the mayor to, to get the lobbyists to work against it, I'm not confident that that will happen based on what the staff have told me in the past. I would, I would like to um, uh, find out how we can get the mayor to cooperate with us in, in, in stopping this legislation. At the very least, as the people in the public said, it gives us more time to look at the options. Why should we be forced into spending potentially billions of dollars? And the last point is, um, it doesn't make sense for the city of Tampa to do this anyway. If we, and I'm talking about the project down the road if we have to do one. 
if, if we have to have some kind of project, why should the city of Tampa ratepayers have to own this? Why should they have hundreds of millions or billions of dollars in debt and increase water rates? They shouldn't. Um, we're part of a regional cooperative. We should let that burden go to the other member governments and we should be a partner in it. We shouldn't go this alone and try to control our own resources. Every other uh, uh, member of Tampa Bay Water sold their resources into, uh, into the um, cooperative back in, in around 1998. Uh, Tampa arbitrarily was left out, and now that's become the excuse that we should always go our own. That, that, that shouldn't be. We, we have people that live in Tampa, work in Pinellas, and vice versa. People are crossing the bay all the time. We need to work as a region. We need to be cooperative, uh, not try to start fights in the region and not try to um, gouge our, um, our rate payers. Thank you. Mr. Chair? Gosman Goods. You know, uh, I, I went in the back and was processing a few things. Uh, I, I'm probably going to make a motion, uh, Mr. Carlson, a little bit later, uh, new business to ask the Florida League of Cities to also look into this They are. Issue. They are. I oh. mentioned it last time I was up oh, there, and I'm going up there this oh. afternoon. Great, great, great. We, at, <clears throat> we as the board of the Florida League of Cities are on this. Okay. okay thank you, Mr. Citra. Councilman Miranda. Thank you very much. I'm not a, one of those prolific speakers that tries to use adjective. I, I speak like I, from where I come from, Ybor City, from the heart. There's groundwater, there's river water, there's well water, water from the bypass canal, seed hell, water from the sea, desal water, and then there's droughts. No matter if you think you know it all, you cannot control one thing, and that's nature. Back in the old Greco administration, somewhere between 95 and 2003, we were, what, a couple of days, I think Mr. Baird was here at that time, from having enough water to service the system that we have. No one, including Tampa Bay Water, had enough water at that time, if I recall, to give water to everybody. And by the way, if I remember that contract that was brought up by a council member, who's the last one who they're going to give water to? Can you tell me? Uh, if our annual average is below 82, we will be the last uh, member That's of government. The city of Tampa, am I correct? City of Tampa, yes. Thank you very much. That's number one. Number two, that bill that we're talking about, the water bill, includes very many things along with the cost of water. Am I correct? It includes the cost of water. It includes the car to garbage pickup. And it includes something that I wanted to do 25 years ago or so, at that time was $2 a month because it was never cost for replacement of what? Water pipes underground and the pipes going to the uh, our recurrent two share retreat. They were never there. We were spending 20 some million dollars a year and increasing every year on not replacing one pipe but replacing, but repairing that same pipe five times a year. And I'm not saying that that's the only pipe that we were replacing, with many pipes. We had breaks in the water line and breaks in those pipes going to the Howard Current on a continuing basis. And if you did that for 30 years, at the end of the day, you would still have the same old, excuse the language, shitty pipe with holes all over it and not one replaced pipe. Am I correct? That's correct. And let's talk about cost of water. I would venture that I would bet everything I own that the city of water, water rate, and why are we conservative so we don't have uh, abusers? As you more you use, the higher it costs it goes. Am I correct? Mm -hmm. That's correct. <clears throat> that is because water is the most precious resources on earth, along with the air. If you don't have clean water and clean air, you can't live. I don't care who you are, I don't care how much money you have, I don't care what your status is in society, you cannot live, period. Am I correct? That's correct. So let's talk about the quality of water and the taste of water. What happens when you buy water from a certain en entity and that water comes from a source other than the different water that you're trading and you have to mix it? Does it taste the same? 
Uh, well, if you're referring to when we purchase water from Tampa Bay Water. I'm referring to the whole, I'm not going to mention names. <laughs> okay. Uh, <laughs> when the city has purchased water from others in the past, and it has been different water quality than the water quality we produce, yes, uh, there have been numerous taste and odor complaints. If I remember the cause, and he's not here now, it's mostly in District 7. That's correct. Am I correct? So when you look at the cost of water per unit, I would venture everything I own that we're far, far under the entity you just spoke about. Yes, sir. So let me understand. I'm not going to mention names, but I said somewhere in October, I think it was, and there was a bond issue for 30 years, and I saw two years of which they were only going to pay interest. I didn't say too much. I want to see what happened. Guess what happened the following month? That, by the way, that went from point A to point B to the year 2058, if I remember, that 30-year bond for $130 million. And I'm going to admit you where. All of a sudden, I believe in October or November, I forget which month, the first 16 years, and I learned that here from sitting here, they were only going to pay the interest. There was only one vote against it, and you're looking at it. Not the experience that I got there, the experience that I got here. When you pay interest for the first 16 years at $6 million or $96 million for those first 16 years, some poor individual, in the end of those 14 years, instead of 30 years, you're going to have to pay the whole cost of the interest again for those first 16 years. Am I correct? Yes, sir. What do you think those people are going to have to pay when that interest rate hits? That they got to pay the water rate going up for the last 14 years of a 30-year deal? How do you think I feel when I see that? Not easy to vote no. For me, it is. Sometimes when you get to my age, it's very simple to say what you got to say. Because at my age, even a life sentence is a short time. <laughs> Let's face it, I'm a realist. I'm not a Democrat or Republic, I'm a realist. So I understand all that. So when I come here and I see these dazzle dazzles and this, that, and the other, I don't play none of those games. I go by the facts that I learned on the street. And I see that coming, and that would be the worst case scenario for anybody and any government to give up their cause. They had to do it because they didn't have a water supply the other day. That war was going on way back up there on uh, the other side of the racetrack about five miles when some county commissioner in the Hillsborough County back before, before Alexander set foot in the wars nine million years ago was sold that piece of property that had the wells to Pine Ellis County, if I remember correctly. That's what sir. started the war. City of Tampa was never in the water wars. Yes, it was Hillsborough County, Pine Ellis, and Pasco at the time. Yes. We were just bystanders. Mm -hmm. And we were asked to get in. And you'd be damned if you don't, you'd be damned if you did. And we got in. And for that, we're going to pay the penalty? Not this guy. I'm never going to vote to sell the city of Tampa's water supply as long as it's run efficiently, as long as it's one with the best kind of operation. And by the way, how do you feel if you lived in New Orleans? And you drank the water from the Mississippi River. And it come from where? Minnesota? It's got to be a thousand miles. I, I would assume we're close to it. How many cities down the Mississippi dump. throw the dump, or the, the tutu water, whatever you want to call it, toilet to tap or piss water, whatever you want to call it, into the Mississippi River? What do you think New Orleans drinks? Do they get the water? I would imagine they got to get some of the water from the Mississippi, or they're going to have green grass for the rest of their life. I don't know what's going on. We get our water mostly from where the green swamp, if I remember, follows into the Hillsborough River and comes on down. I wonder if any other cities up north of us or east of us somewhere is dumping into that area that goes into the green swamp that goes down the Hillsborough River. Anybody thought of that? I have. So it's up to every department in the water district in the whole United States to deal with water, to make it simply the best 
and simply the cleanest, simply the most healthiest, so that all of us can consume that water. There's been a water war between Colorado and I forget well the state for 100 years. And I don't think it's over that. When you look at some of the, the things in the beautiful parks that we have out west, the flows used to be there down 35 feet. 35 feet from the water they used to have. We have a serious problem in this country, and the problem is us. You already have 7 billion people living on Earth, and 8 billion is just around the corner. So we better understand what we're talking about and realize what we have and be able to supply yourself with that water. We did so many things during the drought. The city of Tampa is one of the first in Florida to have a water, and it still has, a, if, I, if I remember correctly, we still have somebody going to run on water in days. And I'm not here to embarrass anybody. If I was to ask every elected official right today in the whole state, what's your water in a day? I've mentioned 80% of them don't know. So what the hell are we talking about? I'm going to stop giving a lecture because I'm not trying to lecture anyone. I'm trying to open your eyes that you have to take care of yourself first. The citizens of this city have always gotten the best water at the best water rate. And again, I'm going to say, anybody wants to put a gamble with me, come on, I'll take you on. On the price of water versus the quality of water versus the district of anyone that they want. End of story. Thank you very much, Mr. Chair. Amen. Any, anybody else? Mr. Weber, go ahead, and then I got, then I got my comments, but it's going to be tough to follow Councilman Miranda. I appreciate it. I just want to, in the, in the spirit of transparency, I, I, I need to just clarify a couple things. First, um, the last two times we have purchased water from Tampa Bay Water, they have provided us water quality that has similar in quality, and we have had zero complaints. So it is possible right now to purchase that water. Tampa Bay Water will not guarantee that water. The only water quality they can guarantee is what's called an Exhibit uh, B, or uh, sorry, Exhibit D, which is part of the agreement. However, Tampa Bay Water has been working uh, to address water quality concerns of the member governments for the last three to four years, and they are embarking or considering. Uh, uh, a $500 million capital project uh, to, um, you know, enhance their water quality so that it will be similar to the water quality we produce. And uh, I just wanted to make sure that it was clear that they didn't come out in the discussion. And the, the one other thing I wanted to clarify is that, uh, you know, Councilman uh, Carlson, to address your comments uh, about the administration, I, I do represent the administration on this project. And if the rationale for the project has not been made clear, I'm really looking forward to being able to do that in January and February through the workshops. Councilman Moran, one just, more, one more I just want to say this. I'm not against Tampa Bay Water. We joined because we wanted to be helpful to Hillsborough County residents, Pine Isles County. We're all human beings, and we wanted that. And we're doing a fine job. But when you take this hole and compare with them, I ain't selling this hole. Thank you very much. I'll be very quick with this. I agree with my colleagues that uh, we need to look to our state representatives. The first question is, how can this have happened? How could you have done this? Uh, I've been living in Tampa since 1974. I've not seen this bay cleaner than it's ever been to this day. We want to take this water Stakeholders want to take this water and purify it to the best that it can be. While I guarantee, well, while I agree, pharmaceuticals, heavy metals, and nitrates. But if we take it that far, why don't we just use it for drinking water? As I see an angler out here, which I am, we know that the estuaries need to be fed with fresh water. I cannot wait until you come back to this workshop and we can have a serious discussion about it. Thank you, Mr. Weber. Thank you, Mr. Baird. Thank you. Ms. Johns. Agenda item number nine. Good morning, Rebecca Johns, Legal Department. 
Uh, we were asked to look at the feasibility of an ordinance that would protect a tenant from eviction for rent that was passed due for more than six months. Evictions are governed by Florida statutes, Chapter 83. Chapter 83 allows a landlord to evict a tenant for a breach of a lease, which would include any failure to pay rent due under the lease. Rent is defined under the statute as any payment due to the landlord pursuant to the lease. There is no limiting language as to a time period. If we were to enact an ordinance limiting that, we wouldn't have the authority to do it because we would be limiting landlords' rights under the statute. However, be aware that prior to an eviction proceeding, a landlord has to provide written notice to a tenant, letting them know how much rent the landlord claims is back due. If the tenant is disputing that amount of rent, that's the exact case that we have the Bay Area legal contract in place for. So we could refer that tenant to Bay Area for legal representation to dispute landlord's claim of the rent owed. Um, I know that Councilwoman Hertek asked for a memo on this, so I will provide that to all of you. Are there any questions? Any questions? Councilman Vieira. Uh, thank you, sir, and thank you very much for your work and research on this. You know, with uh, this was necessitated because of the uh, terrible things happening out at Timber Falls on 113th Street. I was actually just talking to their uh, property manager yesterday. I always try to keep up to date on, on what's happening, et cetera. I'm, I'm glad to hear that at Timber Falls we have a little under two dozen code cases, which is really good. So the city is is trying to hold uh, accountability there. You know, what happened on this instance was you had a lot of residents who heard out of nowhere that they were up to seven, eight, nine, ten thousand dollars $10,000 in back rent um, with assorted fees, et cetera, et cetera. And a lot of it was due to confusion. And many of those cases, thank goodness, have been sorted out, which is good. You know the the and, and I and I obviously understand the um, some of the issues you talked about there and uh, if you have a contract and it's enforceable it's just that there's a right way to do it and that's where the bully pulpit comes in with a lot of these property owners and making sure that they do things the right way and I think Timber Falls is a good example of that in terms of how people sort of move dignity forward uh, in that regard I'll look at this a little further to see if there's anything that we can do um, on this. There, there may be, there may not be in terms of an ordinance, but, uh, but I just wanted to thank you for your work. Thank, thank you. you. Council Member Hurt. Um, I re remember when we were talking about putting that um, Office of Tenant Advocacy together, that we talked about adding this, the phone number, that, that the city's number for the Tenant Advocacy Office, possibly to the eviction notices. I know because if I remember correctly, there are there are like six different phone numbers and folks don't know who to call because they don't know which pertains to them. And our thought was, hey, just put this one number and if you have a problem, we uh, the Tenant Advocacy Office can help direct you to the correct um, person, whether it be um, Bay Area Legal or the apartment complex. I mean, depending on if it's state money or federal money or whatever. Um, do we have any ability to, I mean, how do, how do those other numbers get on there and how can we get our number on there too? Well, I want to clarify which eviction notice you're talking about. So there is a written notice that a landlord sends to the tenant prior to eviction proceedings that states you owe $650 in rent you must pay that within three business days or you must turn over possession of the property. That notice is governed by the statute. The statute actually includes the language to go in that notice. So then if the tenant doesn't pay, then the landlord can pursue eviction proceedings. Those eviction forms are governed by the state courts. And so that Form is what governs what goes so that notice that actually gets filed with the court and served on the tenant that is a form that's governed by the state courts so I don't know that we would in either of those instances because they are governed by the state be able to add or require that city of Tampa language be put on those notices I would I would love to look into that and see if that's something we can do so I'll make a motion later today to do that just just to cover all of our bases and then I know we just had um, uh, Ms. Travis up earlier to talk about passing out the information to 
different apartment complexes and maybe we can somehow add that in because we need to start uh, a component not only for the apartments but for the tenants. Now what we can do is mm -hmm. add this information to the notice of tenant rights that is given to every tenant when they lease an apartment. Okay. So because that is under our jurisdiction okay. so we can add Wonderful. It to that. Yes. So, and so I, I will I will add that. I will come back. We'll have to amend the ordinance. I, I can't remember if it was an ordinance or resolution that approved that notice, but we'll go ahead and add that and bring it back for your approval. Absolutely. And uh, if, if, if I need to make a motion for that, I will absolutely do that. Um, if you uh, talk to, I can talk to you um, or I can, uh, if Kelly will come out, um, my wonderful aide Kelly will come out, um, you all can talk about how you want that language. Uh, but I will absolutely make that motion and thank okay. you so much because that's what I was thinking of. Um, just some way, any more way that we can get that information out to the people who need it uh, and get them to know about it ahead of time or if they don't know about it, a neighbor knows about it. Um, the more, the, the more we, we get that number out, the more we can actually um, uh, help more people with this. So uh, thank you so much, um, Councilman Vieira, for bringing this forward. Anything else? Any other comments or questions? Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you. Agenda item number 10. Good morning again, Council. Nicole Travis, Administrator of Development and Economic Opportunity. I was asked to, um, to provide a presentation on the Bloomberg contract and where we are um, including how many consultants and departments. And so I have a slide deck. Thank you. You just ask and it appears. So what I'm going to go through um, in the slide is identify all the different Bloomberg teams and the number of consultants. We have over 15 active projects um, since March of uh, 2020. And Bloomberg and Associates, um, which is their philanthropic arm, has donated more than 3,500 hours with our teams. Uh, the one thing that you should understand about the Bloomberg contract is that I um, am the administrator that oversees all of the projects um, and interfaces with Bloomberg on which projects are a go and which ones were, are not in alignment with what we're trying to achieve. And so I work with the mayor on that um, just to make sure that we're not off doing random things. So I oversee this, um, this contract in whole. And let me know, you can stop me at any point if you have questions. So um, we have a couple projects with the communications team specifically working on um, their best practices on media engagement, increasing impact on engagement in social media, um, and how to improve uh, story pitching. There are eight Bloomberg experts that's on this team that um, you see the areas of expertise with how to use um, city controlled media, press outreach and support, digital and social media, and crisis, crisis response protocols. And so they're working with our communication department and the portfolios that have public information officers in them. So like I have a PIO, in my office, so when they do the workshop and training of best practices, all the PIOs that are in different departments, there's one um, in Jean's group, OSEA, we all come together to so make sure that we're all on the same page with best practices and how to move forward. Um, the other project that we have is with the Soul Walk. So this is the cultural assets management team. There are three Bloomberg experts, and you can see their areas of expertise on expertise is on cultural promotion, uh, public art investments, and securing grants and other funding strategies uh, to support the arts. And the work that they've done, um, they're working with Robin and I right now on the communication and materials that um, will be presented in January for the Soul Walks launch in January of 2023. Next, um, we have the economic development team. I'll tell you, a majority of the 15 projects are within my uh, portfolio. Um, their areas of expertise are, are really on economic strategy, startup and small business support, um, commercial regeneration projects, workforce development, and industry clusters. And so 
the, there are four experts on the economic development team. The one thing that um, you should know about the Bloomberg team is that their team is, includes former senior leaders at city and state economic development departments. They are focused on implementation and how do we get things from concept uh, to implementation. Um, their commitment is towards um, helping ensure that all residents, particularly those from disadvantaged groups, um, have access to economic opportunity. Uh, this is something we've been working really close and when I show you uh, some of the projects that we've been working on, um, primarily in East Tampa, you'll see. And a lot of the work that we're doing is data driven. Um, so oftentimes, um, Bloomberg staff will assist us in looking at the best practices or even talking through what type of metrics will help us. Um, Councilman Carlson has, ha has talked about the metrics um, and how we measure our economic success and not necessarily doing that at an MSA level, but how is the city of Tampa performing on these, um, on these particular metrics? And it's beyond just the poverty and education metrics. Like what, one of the things that I want to, I'm gonna go off on a tangent now, but one of the things that I want to ensure is that when we provide resources um, and funding for different projects or partner with agencies, we really should be figuring out what is the return on the investment? What, is the, what are the citizens getting from that? Are we really improving economic opportunity for our most disadvantaged citizens? And how do we measure that? And so those are things that just kind of working through that um, is um, with Bloomberg. And the last thing I'll say about the team is that the long-term commitment helps us to see this over time and to put strategies in place that we can measure the success. So the projects that um, that we're working on is uh, developing a short-term economic roadmap. Um, the Mayor's Workforce Council um, Executive Committee, you'll see that they just had a work, uh, workforce summit with Bryn McKinney, um, McKinsey, <laughs> that um, working through the different strategies for um, how are we ensuring that our workforce, that we are capturing and training the workforce. That's working with higher institutions to make sure that we're training our students and going even further into the middle school, high school levels to make sure that we're training our students to stay within our community and what that workforce development looks like. Um, East Tampa, 22nd and Lake development, we're looking for catalytic projects in East Tampa really to jumpstart um, the development. So oh, where am I redevelopment? Hap for, for a minute. Um, private investment follows public dollars. They follow public investment. And so really we want to jumpstart. East Tampa needs a catalytic project. East, East Tampa needs a big win to show private investors that they shouldn't be afraid of investing into the East Tampa area. And so that's what we're working through with Bloomberg, looking at different tax, different tax credit funding projects that have been successful in other communities, um, but we're working on that with them. And also um, using Opportunity Zones, which is a financing mechanism to look, really looking at projects within East Tampa to be able to, to focus on that. Um, there's an internal management team uh, this team, their uh, expertise is really in internal operations and reporting project management. Um, we have four Bloomberg experts on this that's working with OCON's group. Um, this is um, around the project of customer-centric performance systems. Um, they recently had some department interviews. My Different departments within my portfolio were interviewed, trying to figure out not only external customer um, interface, but internal customer interface, and how do we measure our performance and responsiveness? Sustainability a team. This it says sustainability, but um, a lot of it really is around housing affordability, um, the housing supply inventory, um, the projects that we have um, that we're actively working on, community land trust that Elise Drumgo is leading and has a presentation coming to you um, in the beginning of 2023 on this and then the housing needs assessment, writing the scope and making sure that they helped us craft the scope for in trying to understand what exactly the data that we want to capture to make sure that those things were written into the scope. So we 
have the expertise to write scope, but they've provided us with best practices in other major cities that have done needs assessment and what information was helpful then for them to accelerate certain multifamily development, and we included those things in our RFP. Um, the transportation team, road safety, pedestrian infrastructure improvements, bike share, and bike, uh, bike share and cycling infrastructure. There are four Bloomberg uh, experts on this. They work. Um, with Vic directly on these projects. We're looking at quilt builds, projects that are traffic calming and pedestrian safety, projects in four different areas. Um, also looking at uh, the potential of street expansion and uh, future integration of um, bike lanes around Whiting Street. And also being proactive in our traffic calming and pedestrian safety around um, any future development that may happen around the Tampa Union Station. Bloomberg Urban Planning Team um, has three experts. They do a lot of the long-range planning, zoning, um, neighborhood improvement districts, water revitalization, and access. They have three experts on that team. Again, this is in my portfolio. They work very closely with Stephen Benson. Um, one of the things I've talked to some of you about it is the land development code. You've heard it from developers. You feel it at your evening meetings. And uh, we have a 30-year land development code that has been added to and fixed to. And one of the things that, not just for the development community, but for the residents and citizens to understand what the land development code <laughs> is, how to use it, how to follow it, we really need to update our land development code. It hasn't been touched in 30 years. I see why. <laughs> um, but I, you know, one of the things I shared, I mean, shared this with some of you, before taking this position, um, someone that used to work here called me and said, you're very ambitious, but don't try and save the world. Leave the land development code alone. It's a beast. Don't take it on. And my response is, hold my beer. Watch me do it, right? So I, I just know that the land development code is supposed to work not just for developers, but for the citizens and the community and what they want to see with the future, what they want to look like. So I've challenged the, um, the Bloomberg team to, number one, go in and do a forensic audit of our code. Where are there inefficiencies in the code? Are we bringing things to council that they're automatically approving and it's, they, we're just bringing it because the code is not efficient? And so they are going through and doing a forensic audit and that's one of the first things that we're doing. They also, um, started phase one of the public, well, public, but stakeholder interviews, people that use the code a lot to hear any recommendations, how do they feel about the code, and so that we could use that information to guide us in next steps on how do we approach um, rehauling the land, the land development code. I completely went off on a tangent on that. Municipal integrity um, is one of the other teams. There's a group of um, three Bloomberg experts on there. They are specialized in contract, transparency, procurement process, optimization, internal operations, and reporting. Um, this is, sorry, this is where we talk about the land development code forensic audit. This is where they're going through um, rezoning waivers that were submitted between 2021 to find those efficiencies. So the things that I just spoke to you about, it's really the municipal integrity team that's doing that piece while we're doing the stakeholder interviews for the, all of this is, in an effort to make our code easier for the citizens and for you and your long evening meetings. And then lastly, the last um, team that we're working with is the real estate team. Those are uh, two Bloomberg experts on that. And again, this is in my portfolio. We really need to be looking at real estate as a strategic planning um, department and to not be reactive to real estate transactions and deals. Um, they're also conducting interdepartmental interviews because the real estate department handles a lot of the transactional things for stormwater mobility. If we need right of way, a lot of those transactional things, um, they do day to day, but we also need to be very strategic in our land acquisition and disposition and how we manage all of those assets. And so um, we're moving forward with looking at best practices and also systems that's in place to manage our assets and not an Excel spreadsheet, right? So um, this is just a, 
brief overview, these are the projects that we're working on um, that staff would otherwise not have time to work on these types of initiatives. I have to tell you that it makes my job a little easier because a lot of the day-to-day -day is reactionary to who's calling now, what's happening now, and some of this strategic forward focus, planning focus. I don't have the time day-to-day -to, -day to work on that. This allows us extra hands to do that. Councilman Hurtak. Um, I, I can't speak for my colleagues, but I'm going to request that uh, they come interview me about code possibility changes because I think that I think that speaking to oh, yeah. us when we're up here doing it all the time would be would be really wonderful. Oh, so they're, they're going to add us. So I, I'm there. It's on the. It's it's. You're going to be interviewed for awesome. this. That was just phase one that they were because we needed to understand how people felt about the codes to shape the questions on sure. for the people that are implementing the code and then for the residents, interview residents to see how they feel about the code, figuring it out and stuff. So you're up. Great. Thank yep. you. Councilman Goods. Uh, thank you for that, uh, <coughs> Councilman Hurtek. Uh, when you look at the economic <coughs> team, I think we mm -hmm. kind of spoke about it a little bit, uh, and I'm glad to look at some pointers in there, but again, I was at that uh, gala last night uh, reception and uh, was very intrigued at what they were talking about. And I'm, I'm, I'm kind of puzzled now, and I've been saying this for a while in my mind, our EBO department should not be under Ms. Wynn's portfolio. It should be under the Economic Development Office portfolio. And, and, and the reason I say that, uh, not that she's not capable of anything, I just believe that economic development in small businesses that's a part of EBO, and that should be close to uh, your office. And, and, and if I'm interviewed, I'm going to say that uh, because when I, again, when I looked at some of the other counties um, you know, who are a little bit more progressive than us, we're trying to move. Uh, they, uh, their department heads, can do an RFP, RFQ, RFI, but it doesn't go out. It has to go to another office to oversee and look and make sure that. The points are there, and that those numbers are there. So you have a cross checker saying, "Okay, yeah, but you missed this and this and this." So no, that can't go out because you're missing this, this, and this. You're talking about ensuring that small businesses are able to participate. There in the you go. There okay. you go. There you go. Off, off, off the cuff. So I'm hoping that they they look at that strategy, and hopefully that uh, you'll take that back to administration because I just don't believe that the EB office should be under the neighborhood enhancement team under that portfolio. To me, that's economic development, and I, I believe that works hand in hand with what you're trying to do in our small businesses. So uh, that that would be my suggestion uh, going forward. And uh, again, uh, hoping we can make those changes because I, I believe if we look at uh, what other people are doing, and I'm going to suggest that uh, maybe they're off or your office. I don't make a motion, but I I know they're listening. That they go and look and see what the Orange County public school system is doing and how they are operating. Uh, and how Orange County is operating with their their system, uh, and I, you know I, I, everybody in the room was applauding, saying that they they are, they're like the number one people uh, out beating Miami of how they're uh, getting their small businesses uh, involved, uh, the money process and the training that they're doing. Uh, and again, uh, it's to me, uh, I always like to go to train because you always can learn something new. And when you hear that another idea is working and everyone in this room is saying, wow, and they can be able to demonstrate how it's working, then that's just something I think we, I always look at and I think we should look at as well. So if your officer, someone can check into what they're doing, what's kind of public school system and how their EBO office is working. Uh, they call it minority business over there. Uh, that's what they call it. Uh, we call it EBO here, but again, to me, they had a great system. Thank you. Councilman Carlson. Um, Statement and two questions. Um, one, thank you for doing this. Uh, a lot of my constituents had concerns about this contract and, and the relationship of Bloomberg embedded in, in, uh, in departments. And this has given us some insights into it. I'm sure they will want more details. Before I comment on any of it, I, I want to get feedback from constituents. So anybody watching, please let me know your thoughts on this. Uh, but thank you, Ms. Travis, for going through that. So two questions. One, uh, can I assume that all the communication with them and all their work product is being preserved in public record? Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. Okay. Anything. And in fact, there's someone that regularly emails me that asks for work um, for like any 
final documents and I send them to them. Yeah. And, and, okay, and then the second thing is um, uh, we've seen in the, they've been working with us 18 months or two years? Well, two. I've been here since January and the contract was approved in okay. March. So in so, the. So just since the beginning of this year. So I have to ask this question and it touches a couple of departments you mentioned. Um, during that time, this, the, um, the attacks by the mayor's office against city council members has escalated rapidly. And um, uh, it, there are city rules and state laws that prohibit staff from being involved in that. Um, we have seen evidence from several sources that staff have been involved and, and so I'm asking legal about that. Uh, but um, the, uh, the question is, um, is there anything in the contract with Bloomberg that prohibits them from participating in politics um, uh, uh, while they're not getting paid, and mm -hmm. so part of the prohibition with the with the employees is that if they're working on city hours and getting paid by the city, they shouldn't be posting on social media or sending texts or writing um, uh, for p a political purpose. But uh, is there anything in the contract that prohibits Bloomberg people from participating in that? And can you assure me that they have not been involved in the escalation of attacks against council members? Oh, I can assure you that they have not. Okay. I can assure you that they have not. I'll have to go back and look at the contract in, in detail to see any um, prohibition as far as politics, but I interact with all the teams, and I assure you that they are not involved in any of that. Yeah, I mean, an example is that for the last eight meetings or so, every time I speak, we get a correction afterwards, and the corrections aren't accurate, but it's obviously a political tool to try to so well, that's happening from the communications office. Yeah. Bloomberg's I just want to make sure it. Bloomberg, suddenly that's happened in the last few, few months. I want to make sure Bloomberg's not participating in any no. of that. No. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Councilwoman Hurtek. Um, I, I forgot to mention this earlier. Thank you for this. Um, can we get a copy of it? Of course. Awesome. Thank you. Councilman Vieira. Thank you very much. And I'm glad Councilman Carlson <clears throat> made this motion because I, I was getting a few questions and I discussed this with you yesterday and this provides a lot of clarification. For me, a real dispositive issue here is when you say this helps me do my job. Yes. And I think that's really important. You're yes. very overworked. You're very valued here, et cetera. And if this helps you do your job, that's great. I do think, however, given the number of questions, like I said yesterday, um, that, that are presented on this, it would be good to have this come back periodically maybe once a year or whatever for updates on what Bloomberg is doing, given those questions, et cetera. Um, you know, it's funny when, when, when this, this past six to one, you know, in retrospect, I wish that uh, I can only speak for myself, that more scrutiny would have been applied to this so we could have maybe prevented some of those questions and dealt with it as you've done in your very comprehensive report. So if something does come up um, to maybe have this come up for review once a year, whatever it may be, I would be very supportive of that. Uh, but again, I, I, I thank the motion maker and I thank you for your uh, presentation. Thank you. My pleasure. And if anyone that's watching, because I know Ms. Stromeyer said that she's watching, if she has questions, I'm more than happy to, um, to speak with her and answer any other questions that anyone may have. Councilman Goods. What I didn't mention, I had on my pad here. Uh, well, I didn't mention, you talked about the new tax credits. Mm -hmm. And when you, you look at it again, I go back to Orlando again, and uh, you I'm gonna know, get be, you to stop comparing. I know, I know, I know. You're gonna get, <laughs> cause I, I know you have no business. You, you took Lakeland to the stars, you have no business. But they use a lot of the new tax credits yeah to do a lot of the programs, housing and things like that in that area with the BBIF and some of these other organizations who are trying to come here to Tampa to start moving things here. So uh, they know about you, so they, they want to come here because they know about you. So that's, uh, you, so you're a superstar. I, I tell you, you know, people want to work around you. So that's that's a good thing, you know, and I, I'm happy to be, you know, be a part of that with you. So I just want to make mention that that, 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 that new tax credit is, you know, a person told me, why isn't Tampa taking advantage of that? Why are we not taking advantage of the tax credit? But I, you have it here, so I know you, you, you're you the guru. You're already looking at that. So we can be able to take advantage of these new tax credits to be able to leverage our dollars to get more things going. So again, thank you for putting that in and saying that. Absolutely. Anyone else? Thank you, Ms. Travis. Thank you very much. Council, uh, we have Ms. Jennifer Cohen here, and she has been sitting patiently here, but now before you get up, Ms. Cohen, I'm, I'm going to make a, a, a question, a statement here. 
Uh, she is with the attorney firm of the legal firm of Bryant Miller and Olive, and she is here to address and present items 19 through 23. I see that it is 1220 now. Shall we yes. get as much done as we yep. can, i.e. the uh, consent agenda items now, so that when we come back at 130, we can take our time with agenda items 19 through 23. Mr. Chairman, I've been thinking about this, and I think we should break for lunch until 1.30. Uh, start up with 18, go right into 19, 20, you know, for the, uh, the attorney that is here. And then after that, it's um, the consent agenda, which is quick. And then we have one, uh, one review hearing, or yeah, one, yeah, one review hearing for, uh, that starts at 1.30 anyway. But I think, you know, if we take lunch now, we can knock out the, uh, the charter stuff and item number 18 and it'll be smooth sailing. Motion to uh, go into recess for lunch until 1.30. 1.30 is kind of tight, but. 1.15. No, I meant like 1.45, but yeah. <laughs> uh, uh, well, 1.30. We're recessed until 1.30.